I know there's been a lot of questions about it, so we're using satellite Galaxy 17 K10 slot A, and the downlink is 11886.5V. We'll be starting shortly with the student athletes from Xavier. We'll be joined by Jerome Hunter, Jack Nunja, and Colby Jones. In the format, we'll have 20 minutes with them. Then we'll be joined by Coach Miller for 20 minutes. And then they'll be followed by the student athletes at 220 from Pittsburgh, followed by their coach from 240 to 3 p.m. Then we'll go into Kentucky and then Kansas State. Yes. A reminder that the locker rooms will be open as well, and we ask everybody to remind everybody that recording the press conference on cell phones or your cameras is prohibited, and the locker rooms will be open the entire 40 minutes that we're up here with the coaches and the student athletes. Okay, we are about to start with Xavier, Jerome Hunter, Jack Nunja, and Colby Jones. Huh? All 
right, guys. No, he just wants to bring something in here. Always. We'll let, we'll let everybody else talk first because Colby has to process his food here. Okay, we have from left to right, Jerome Hunter, Jack Nunja. Pronounce that right? Nunji. Nunji, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. And Colby Jones. Questions? Raise your hand. Let us get the handheld mics to you. Let us know who you are, who you're with, and also please um, address it to a specific student athlete. First question right here, second row. Adam Baum, Cincinnati Enquirer. Jack, where are you guys at? in the process uh, of preparing for Pittsburgh? Like how much could you do last night? And what, what are you doing this morning and today to get ready for that game? Yeah, I think uh, after our game yesterday, we got to catch some of it um, live in person. So that was a good scouting for us. And then uh, last night, we kind of went over the personnel. And um, we're just kind of working through some of their actions, uh, some of the things they do defensively. And um, you know, we still have a ways to go. We're going to have some more scouting to do tonight, walkthroughs and stuff like that. but. Definitely in the process, for sure. Paul Frischner with the Big East Digital Network. Colby, how good does it feel to get a win in the NCAA tournament, <clears throat> kind of behind you, get a win behind you, and, and now look forward into the next game? Yeah, it definitely feels good knowing that um, we didn't have our best game as a team, and we still got a way to, we still found a way to advance. And I feel like with that game behind us, I feel like, the real Xavier team is going to come out Sunday, and uh, that's how we're going to play. Back left. Guys, if I may ask each of you, what do you know about your coach's college career at Pitt? Jerome. Uh, I don't really know much about it. I've just been seeing stuff on Twitter, but I still don't know a lot about it. Jack. I've uh, seen a few pictures here and there. Um, coach kind of told us, you know, what Pitt means to him. He has a lot of friends there. and. Obviously, you know, it's his alma mater, so he, the university kind of means a great deal to him. Um, I know, like, last week at the Big East Tournament, he kind of used that as a, as a motivation for us because he said he never really advanced, and so we kind of were able to, um, you know, advance for him. I knew he was a solid PG at Pitt, but um, I know that one pass he had when the guy broke the uh, backboard, I know that was pretty cool. So watching that video it reminded me of him. Front left. Jerry DePaula, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. I'll piggyback on that question. Are you guys aware that he was a basketball prodigy in fourth grade and back in <laughs> Pittsburgh? He was on a Tonight Show and showed off his ball handling skills. Jack? Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, I, there was one, one day where I was just YouTubing it and saw some of his highlights. It's some pretty cool stuff that he could do when he was a, he was a kid. Colby, what kind of a handle does Coach have? Uh, I didn't really, I didn't know that he was on the Tonight Show. That's, so that's pretty cool for, especially in fourth grade. So, yeah, that's, I didn't know that. Jerome? Yeah, I didn't know that either. Um, it is pretty cool that he was on the Tonight Show. You've stumped our panel. Next question. <laughs> uh, Chris Carter, Post, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Um, you guys have been a, a great three-point shooting team when you've been at, at, at your best. Pitt has also been a team that's been able to shoot uh, from deep in some of their best games this season. How do you guys approach this person-to-person, -person, you know, two teams that have similar strengths when they've played those kind of games this season? Go far right. Colby. Uh, yeah, we definitely have to um, lock in on our transition defense. We know that when they, when they get out and running, shoot those open three, that's when they're deadly. So we definitely have to work on that. And... Um, yeah, like, we, like you said, when they're winning games, they're making a lot of three-pointers, so we definitely have to um, eliminate that for sure. Jack? Yeah, huge emphasis for us this game is uh, to limit their three-point shots. Um, you know, across the board, it seems like almost every guy on their team is a, a great three-point shooter, whether they shoot a lot or have a great percentage. So we're going to really have to lock in on that aspect if we want to win this game. Jerome? Um, I would just say, uh, yeah, we shoot the ball good in our good games, but – even if we're not shooting well, we're going to find, we always find a way to win. So, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> to our left. Noah Hiles, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Obviously, this is your group's first time playing in this tournament with Coach Miller. What have you seen his ability to prepare for games the way he does with his experience in coaching in this so many times? 
Jerome? Um, you could just tell he's experienced. He's been through a lot of big games. He's been in this situation before, and so he always just tell us just listen to him and just follow him, and that's what we all been doing lately, and it's been working. Jack? Yeah, Coach, you know, he has a lot of experience. Um, you know, it's, as Rome said, we just got to listen to him. Um, you know, it's March. Anything can happen. Uh, we're never really out of a game, as it, as it showed yesterday. Um, just got to stay the course, uh, try to do what we do out there, and, and just play our best basketball. Colby? Um, yeah, sort of piggybacking off of what they said, um, you can definitely tell the experience he has just of, like, his demeanor throughout the games. And um, he's not really – he's not trying to do something else to prepare for the tournament. We're doing our same old stuff every day. And I feel like that's going to pay dividends for us. Back of the room. Hey, guys. Corey Chris at DK Pittsburgh Sports. Jack, this is for you. You mentioned um, kind of scouting Pitt yesterday, watching their game against Iowa State. What was the – biggest mental note that you took about watching that team and what was your biggest takeaway from just seeing that game? Yeah, they played, uh, you know, really well defensively. They held Iowa State to 41 points. That's just really impressive in itself. And then, um, you know, as you see, they have great three-point shooters across the board. Um, that's just going to be a huge emphasis for us. Uh, you know, we're just going to have to stay, stay the course throughout the whole game, 40 minutes. Um, you know, if things don't go our way, we're just going to have to stick together and uh, hopefully come out on top. Second row. Colby, there, there was a picture on Twitter from the game uh, last night. I think it was when you were at the foul line, and it looked like TV cameras caught your mom in the stands. Did you see that? Yeah, I did, yeah. What, what did you think of, of seeing that moment and, and how much she was invested in, in you at the free throw line in that spot? I mean, she's been that way my whole life in games, uh, especially in close games. She always texts me after those, saying like we gave her a heart, gave her a heart attack or something like that. <laughs> but um, that's just the support that she has for me, and I love her for it. And uh, yeah, it was definitely cool for her to look at, get a little TV time as well. So yeah, back of the room, Colby. Why is it that your group shares the ball so well? What is it about that you guys are so un un unselfish? I think we just have a great team chemistry. We have a, older guys on our team, and we all just, just know the game of basketball. And we know, like, we're just trying to get the best shot each time for Xavier, and I feel like that's why we share the ball so well. I, I believe when, when Sean took over, there weren't a whole lot of guys who transferred from Xavier. Why is that? Have you used when a new coach comes in, all of a sudden the roster turns over? Uh, yeah, I feel like everyone, he came in and told us the truth. He didn't try to sugarcoat anything. And I feel like our guys really liked that. We bought into his his process and his ideas. And um, our guys, we just wanted to stick together one more year because we knew we had a special team. And that's what ended up happening. Jerome? Uh, yeah, like um, us winning the NIT tournament last year and coming off that, we all just felt like we could have did more last year. But this year was the year that we could do what we're doing now. Jack? Yeah, just from the, you know, everything that happened last year, you know, playing really well for most of the season, then kind of fading down the stretch. And then that run we went on, um, we kind of knew what we were capable of. Um, and I feel like, you know, everybody just really locked in, uh, just wanted to make the most of this year. We didn't want to let what happened last year kind of affect us this year and uh, just really try to maximize our potential. And I feel like Coach gave us kind of the best opportunity to do that. On the aisle. Uh, Chris Carter, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Uh, when you scout teams, you often like you know get to look at multiple games they've had throughout the year. But for Pitt, uh, their two freshman twins, the Diaz Graham twins, are you know guys seven feet tall. They're getting more playing time in the tournament. Does does that you know does their recent boost in playing time? You know what have you guys seen from them and how they've played the last two games and how that factors in how you prepare for a team like that? Jack. Yeah, um, you know you kind of see throughout their the year their growth. They're playing really well. They're playing their best basketball this time of year. So that's going to be a, a huge part of our, our game plan is trying to, you know, limit their their um, impact on the game. Um, you know, that's going to be a huge emphasis for us is how, how well they play. And, uh, yeah, as I'm saying, they're they're just getting better. You can see it through, you know, every possession, every every step. And so Jerome. it's going to be a challenge. Sorry, Jerome? Yeah, just watching the film with the team and watching it, talking to the coach, um, yeah, they're getting better every game. They can really shoot. They play hard. Um, we're just going to have to limit their impact on the game, just like what Jack said, and just um, do what we do every game. Back of the room. Corey Chris and DK Pittsburgh Sports. Guys, you played 
against a relatively strong Big East this year. There were seven teams that finished with records of 500 or better. And I know you guys played Duke earlier in the season. Just how did playing that strong non-conference and then kind of battle-tested uh, conference schedule prepare you guys for this NCAA tournament? Colby. Uh, yeah, it definitely helps because you see, you get to see different style of style of plays, different kind of players. So you're getting a whole a variety of different teams that you could potentially see in the tournament. So I feel like it definitely helps just to go out and play, play great teams and great programs. Jack? Yeah, I feel like, you know, when we went out to Portland, um, you know, there's just some really skilled teams out there uh, that are, you know, have the potential to make a run during March. So, was, you know, great, great learning experience for us kind of to see where we're at, but also just, you know, we can kind of build on those, those experiences so that we can have the rewards uh, down the line. Jerome? Um, yeah, I just think playing against them different teams, different styles, it just prepared us for the Big East. And um, just whatever they threw at us, I just felt like we were prepared just because playing against the different teams, the different styles just um, made us have to adjust to different defenses, different offenses, and different players. Guys, T. Reed from the Associated Press. Um, does, does having a close call like in that first round of the tournament, does it almost kind of refocus you as like, you know, hey, you know, we can't afford any slip ups, can't afford to fall behind. Does it kind of refocus you coming into the second game? Jerome? Uh, yeah, that's been our mindset all season. Um, we don't take any team lightly. Um, we know March, we, like, I haven't never been here and I knew every game was going to be hard. I know every game is going to be hard. Every team is good. That's why they're here. So um, just playing that game, I feel like it did wake us up and just realize that we're here. These teams are trying to win as bad as we are, and we got to play our best every night. Jack. Yeah, the fight that, that we showed for the last, you know, 10, 15 minutes of the game, um, we got to play that, you know, the whole 40 minutes if we want to, you know, keep advancing in this tournament. Um, I mean, yeah, anybody can win, as it showed, you know, yesterday and the day before. And so it's really just, you know, going to be a battle for all 40 minutes. Kobe. Yeah, I mean, all credits to Kennesaw State. I mean, they're a great, great team. They give us a great punch. Um, but like sort of what Jack said, I feel like those last 15 minutes, really, um, we really woke up then, and that's what we talked about. That's how we need to play the rest of the tournament. So I feel like it definitely was a wake-up call for sure. Front left. Uh, Jerry DePaul at Pittsburgh, what caused that trigger? Because that game sort of turned yesterday very suddenly. Colby? Uh, yeah, I feel like hey, each person to a man, we just took it personal that we weren't, we didn't want to go out that way. I feel like our energy just picked up, players and coaches included. And I feel like that's what was the difference in the game. Jack. Yeah, we just kind of, you know, every every huddle or every timeout that we had, we just kept chipping away, keep chipping away, um, stay the course. You know, things didn't really go our way for most of the game, but we knew if we kept fighting, uh, kept staying together, that we could uh, could come out on top. Jerome. Yeah, every game, coach give us 10 wars. Um, that's how many wars we get in the game. And whoever wins the most wars wins the game. So that's all we just focus on each timeout, each time we're talking, we just talk about each war. And did we win this war? Did we win this? I mean, did we win this war or did we lose this war? And that's really all that matters. Jack, when you look back at the games at DePaul and at Butler against teams that on paper it feels like Xavier probably should have beat, that you didn't end up winning those games, and now you get into the Big East tournament and you come back against DePaul and you come back against Kennesaw State, how much do you think back to those games earlier in the season and, and draw on that experience to dig yourself out of a hole and win a game like yesterday? Yeah, like we just we just got to stay together. Um, you know, we, we know we have a good team. We just uh, – things don't go our way. We got to just keep fighting. Uh, you know, we're never really out of it as it showed. And, you know, we know if we keep, you know, doing what we're supposed to do out there that, you know, things are eventually going to take a turn for us. And so we just got to stay together, fight. You know, it's a 40-minute game. It's not a game about the first half or the second half. You know, it's, it's the whole game. So we just got to stay connected throughout it. We have some members of the media on Zoom. If you have a question, please use your raise hand function. Any other questions here? Okay, no questions on Zoom. Okay, thanks, guys. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys.
Okay, we'll do, we're due to start with Coach Miller at 1.55, about a couple minutes, and we have 20 minutes with him. Okay, questions for Coach Miller. Hey, Coach. Steve Reed from the Associated Press. I asked your players this. Um, I'm sure you felt like you had the attention of your players going into the tournament, but when you have to come back the way you guys did and, and battle back and win, does it almost kind of refocus? Do you feel like it helps refocus them as to, you know, hey, we can't have any letdowns at any point during the game? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I do feel that way. Uh, very reminiscent uh, for our group on what happened last weekend in Madison Square Garden in the Big East tournament. You know, we played DePaul in our opening round, and uh, DePaul had us down in a very similar fashion. As a matter of fact, I, I think the fact that we went through that in our conference tournament may have helped us yesterday. Uh, but when that game ended, I felt like we were able to take a deep breath, lessons learned. Uh, we became a more united group, more focused group. Not that we weren't the day earlier, but um, clearly I think, like you said, we had their attention. And we ended up going out and playing one of our best games of the year the next day against Creighton. And my hope is, obviously we're not playing today, but in tomorrow's game against Pitt, that we can be better and uh, we can be more consistent from start to finish. In yesterday's game, we had some really good moments, and uh, but we, we weren't as consistent as we needed to be. Left aisle. Sean, Sean. Uh, you mentioned yesterday about Sule missing that layup and then hitting those four free throws down the stretch. How hard is that um, psychologically for someone to do, and what did that show you about him? Yeah, very difficult uh, to you know answer your question. Sule Boom is one of the uh, most clutch players that I've been around. Um, he's won us numerous games this year during the regular season in a very similar fashion as he did yesterday, and that is, you know, he's a great free throw shooter, but in particular, it's almost as if he's even better when it means the most. And uh, you're right, the layup that he missed, I, I think, surprised all of us. But for him, his age, his experience, his wisdom, his belief in himself, it really showed because, uh, you know, a big reason we won is he made four consecutive free throws and iced the game. Back of the room. Austin Bechtold, Pittsburgh Sports Now. Sean, what have you noticed from Pitt throughout the season and in the last couple of tournament games? And what overall in your playing career have you learned that you've taken now in your coaching career from being at Pitt? Uh, well, first question is, you know, I, I, I think Jeff Cable has done an, an incredible job. You know, anybody that took over at the time that he took over and, and went through the pandemic and also had to rebuild, um, you know, there's things that happened during that period of time that I don't think has ever happened in maybe the history of, of college basketball. And just to see him go from a year ago to this year's team, uh, they're very, very good. Uh, I know, heck, I've followed them uh, late in the year, and they almost won the ACC regular season championship. So we know we're playing a tough team. You know, I, I think their skill level really jumps out for me. When they win, they make threes. Uh, as a matter of fact, they make more than 10 per game. And I, I think that when they don't uh, make threes, not that they won't win, but uh, they're not on their game. You know, I, I think those threes are going down. You know, you have so many different players that can shoot them. And... Uh, you know, I think Henson, the way they utilize him, he's really an X factor because uh, you have to guard him with a forward, and he's such an elite shooter, and uh, he can really get going. So their shooting really stands out for me, and I also think uh, in this tournament they played some excellent defense, played with great effort. My playing career, I mean, there's a lot of lessons that I have, uh, you know, as, as it applies to this tournament that, you know, it's a brand-new season and it ends quickly. And I learned that in college, uh, unfortunately, in a heartbreaking way. Back of the room. 
Hey, Sean, Jeff Hathorne, KDK Radio in Pittsburgh. Um, just emotionally, I, you probably assumed at some point in your career you might have a situation like this, but to face Pitt in the NCAA tournament. Well, yeah, I mean, it's actually the second time. Uh, when I was at Xavier the first time, I guess we're going to go back maybe 14 years ago. Jamie Dixon was the coach. Uh, we happened to catch them in the Sweet 16 in Boston. Um, they were a one seed, and they had a chance to win a national championship. Dewan Blair was on that team, Sam Young, LeVance Fields, and uh, LeVance hit a big shot at the end that beat us. Um, so this is the second time, and uh, I'm much older. You know, I would say that you could pick uh, any team in this round, and as much as I love Pittsburgh, and my wife and I both attended Pitt, have some of the you know people that I love the most in life live in that city. Um, but tomorrow, you know, it's about, it's about winning the game and getting to the Sweet 16. So although I have a, a soft spot for them, and I'm sure it's no different on their end, you know, when you get to this round, the prize is so significant for your team and your university that, you know, that's really my focus. Back of the room again. Sean, Corey, Chris, the DK Pittsburgh Sports. Um, and kind of continuing on that theme here, the, the, this past year, Pitt celebrated the 35th anniversary of Jerome Lane's send it in dunk. You obviously assisted on that play. Just what is it like to kind of be associated and tied in with such a significant play that not just in Pitt history, but also in college basketball history when you think about it and reflect on it? Yeah, you know, I, I make this statement once in a while, and I, I don't know if anybody pays attention, but I think that dunk, that play makes a strong case for, you know, the greatest dunk in, in college basketball history. You know, it's it was on Big Monday, I believe, in front of the nation. And uh, I think the only negative about the play and to be associated with it for so long is sometimes I, I don't think that people really take into consideration the great player that Jerome Lane was. You know, I, it, it almost as if he, he, he made that one play, but he led the nation in rebounding, was an All-American, uh, an NBA player, just an incredible player too. But... He was inducted into Pitt's Hall of Fame this fall. I was really grateful that I could attend. Saw him and a lot of teammates. It was great to be there. And, uh, yeah, for sure. The one thing when you're a part of that play, it, you, no one can ever accuse you of not playing. Every February, uh, you remind them that you, you at least could dribble and pass. <laughs> Left aisle. Coach, I don't know if you'll share this with us. Was there, is there ever a point in your career where you were close to going back to Pitt as head coach? No, not really. It, it, it never worked out. And, um, you know, I think for me, that's, that's all the better because, you know, in some ways I want my memories of Pitt to be when I was there as a student, as a player, uh, some of the greatest years of my life, playing in the Big East Conference, uh, you know, meeting people like Curtis Aiken, you know, does the radio for Pitt, who, you know, took me under their wing, treated me like I was like a younger brother. And I really learned a lot uh, on and off the court through my experience at Pitt, uh, as much off the court as on the court. And it's a big reason why I wanted to go into coaching, you know, to be around that. Uh, and those are some great times. So those are my memories, that and, you know, family and friends. It's, I think it's simpler that way. Middle of the room. Uh, Sean, what stands out to you about Pitts, Nelly Cummings, and do you share any kind of, do you see yourself in him being a Beaver County guy, being the point guard at Pitt? Yeah, Nelly, Nelly is a, a very good player. Uh, you know, what, what I like about him is that he can both score, a double-figure score, and he also makes his teammates better. You know, they're almost interchangeable. You know, sometimes Burton can have the ball. Obviously, sometimes Cummings can have the ball. And... Um, that's what makes their team so good. They, they, they're interchangeable, and obviously, uh, in Nelly's case, he can beat you with his scoring, his three-point shooting, and he can also beat you by getting in the lane and making people better. Oh, good. Noah Hiles, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Sean, I'm just interested, what sold you on Pitt when you were a senior in high school? I mean, you had a lot of other big-time programs and coaches recruiting you. What made you want to stay at home and play for the Panthers? I mean, that's really an easy answer. It's the same um, answer I would give you about Xavier, and that is, uh, you know, I wanted to play in the Big East. I wanted to play in the greatest conference in college basketball. Uh, I wanted to join a team that had a chance to uh, win, to make a run into Final Four in a city that I grew up in, 
John Calipari was the assistant coach. Um, he was a great recruiter, somebody that I knew and my family knew since we were very young in age, and that was a big reason as well. But it was a great decision. On the aisle. Another Sule question. Uh, how, how did he end up at Xavier? Well, um, when I got the job and we had a new staff late in the spring, Paul Scruggs really was the, the point guard at Xavier for multiple years, and he was graduating. And uh, we needed somebody to replace him, somebody who had experience. So really, we just cast a net and, and wanted to get somebody that was older that we thought could come in and, and uh, meet the Big E standards on a team around him that had, had some other answers. And uh, we recruited several players. Uh, we had to obviously convince him to come to Xavier. But we had a great opportunity for him. And I think that's the one thing about transfers. You know, what you say you have in terms of opportunity, you really have to have it. And what we talked about, him being on a, a ready-made team, being a point guard, having an opportunity to play big minutes, those are all things that, in fact, we had for him. And Sule is a great kid. The other part of him meshing so well with our team is he's so likable, off the court, in the locker room. He never rubbed anybody the wrong way as if he was here for his own goals and dreams. And um, I think he'll tell you sitting up here that one of the reasons that he came to Xavier is he wanted to be in the tournament. He wanted to play in the NCAA tournament, something he had not done. So the other part that helped us is me coming from the West. I knew Oakland, California. Uh, he knew more about me, know more about our staff. And I, I think that probably made him more comfortable as well. Second row. Good. Sean, there we go. In the game yesterday, Sule and Adam went at it a little bit there. Mm -hmm. I asked Sule about it after the game. Do, do you like that? Do you like that they, they care that much? Does, how do you feel about that? Yeah, look, um, that situation is very easily explained. Two, two players that saw their career, college career coming to an end, it's a bad feeling. And it brought out raw emotions and competitive spirit, in both of them. It was repaired in five minutes, but there's no doubt they care. And, uh, you know, we've worked really hard to get to the tournament. Uh, when you're in it, you don't want to ever leave, but in particular in the first round. And I, I think that just really was the fight inside of them to, to play another day. So um, I guess to really answer your question, it really didn't affect me at all. I, I'd rather pull guys back than, you know, slap them in the butt to speed them up. And, uh, and those two guys are very mature, older, and I clearly understand their feelings. So it was really nothing. And I know it played itself out on a national stage, but uh, you know, I, I think that they're both as happy as any people in Gre Greensboro, North Carolina, to be here. Middle of the room. Speaking of Greensboro, North Carolina, you and your brother, Sean, have had a number of games here in this building. In fact, if memory serves, I think you were part of that state staff that nearly won an ACC championship here. Any nostalgia at all being back in the Greensboro Coliseum? Well, you're right. Um, when, I, when I think of Greensboro, that's what I think of the ACC tournament, which being that we're playing Pitt is probably not a good thing. Um, but this has always been a place that uh, it's like tournament town, right? I, I think I've read that a little bit. Uh, the respect of the ACC tournament and uh, the love of college basketball in this area is, is second to none. That, that's what I know. And one of my most vivid memories, you know, I'm going back into uh, 1997. And, you know, Dean Smith was the coach at North Carolina. And we had a bus driver drive us from Raleigh, North Carolina uh, to Greensboro. You know, not a big, long trip. And he was our bus driver, and he's around us for the practices and the games. We ended up playing Carolina in the ACC championship. And I remember getting on the bus as a young assistant. Our season was over. They beat us. And there was this powder blue car with the doors open. And I kept seeing our bus driver take a Coke, like a Coca-Cola, and put it in the console. And he was, like, pacing around. And all of a sudden, I saw Coach Smith get in the car, hug him. 
he shut the door and he got back on our bus. And I remember thinking, man, life's not fair in this area. <laughs> that was a lesson for a young college coach right there. Uh, that, that guy probably drove Dean Smith for 30 years. And here we are, have no idea, you know. But that's what you think of when you get in Greensboro. Yeah, tournament time, college basketball, and really a town that understands it and, and loves it. And we're, we're happy to be here. We've had a great time so far. To our left. Sean, I know you talked about it a little bit already, but what do you remember from that Sweet 16 game the first time you played Pitt in the tournament? And, and did that loss sting a little extra because it was your alma mater and because you were about to move on to another opportunity? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I really mean this. Whether we beat Pitt or Pitt, Pitt beats us, and, you know, it's just, it, it just stings because your season's over and you can't advance. You know, it's, there's always storylines. You know, Jamie Dixon happened to be the coach then, and I really admire Jamie. I think he's one of the great coaches in our game. Um, but, you know, what I remember as much as anything is just, you know, they moved on and played Villanova, and I believe that became Jay Wright's first Final Four team. And we were, we were a play away from playing Villanova for the same, for the same thing. And, you know, the, the tournament, why it's so great is if you advance, it's the greatest feeling in the world for all of us. And when you leave, somebody comes in and tells you the time that your plane's going to leave and you almost get kicked out of the tournament, you know. So each tournament is going to end one way or the other. Most of the time that finality is going to hit you. But that's why we have to survive. That's why we have to be at our best. And really in our case right now, take advantage of our seed and try to be a better team tomorrow than we were yesterday. And I think if we are, that's going to give us our best chance. Middle of the room. Sean, how uh, challenging is it to maybe prepare for a team like Pitt where they have a new starter and the Guillermo Diaz Graham has just kind of come out of nowhere? What have you seen from him? And have you ever seen this from a freshman just kind of blow up on the NCAA tournament like this? No, for sure. We've talked a lot about that with our team. I respect uh, him a, a great deal and his brother. You know, the, the one thing is they're skilled, but like their ability to offensive rebound, playing with great effort, block shots, run hard, play hard. It's impressive. I think as, as they and as he gets stronger, um, you know, he's going to have a very, very bright future. And one of the big reasons that Pitt is, is here is because of his overall play and improved play. So we, we recognize that, and, uh, and we've certainly made our team aware of it. Second row left. Jerry DePaul of Pittsburgh. Sean, you made a couple of references the last couple of days about the devastation you feel when you lose in this tournament. Uh, how long did it take you to get over that loss, and have you gotten better at it over the years? Because everybody, except for one team, suffers it every year. No, I've gotten better at it. You know, uh, I don't want to say I've gotten used to it, but, you know, look, there's only one team that's going to end their season with, uh, with a win. And I'm, I'm sure if you get to the Final Four. And I've been fortunate. I've been in the Elite Eight four times. I think around the Sweet 16 seven times. Um, and when you get into those two rounds right there, man, it's, there's a lot at stake. And uh, that's what's so special about this game. This is the game that allows you to get to that next four-team tournament. And, uh, you know, we, we want to be at our best. I, I think every team that plays in this second round feels it. And, again, that, it's what this tournament, it captivates everybody. Last year I watched it without a team. And, you know, it, it captivated me just watching different teams and storylines. You know, you fall in love with the, those couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can stick around. Back of the room. Sean, what is it about this group that allows it to share the basketball so well? Well, we're a very skilled team, and we're also an unselfish group. You know, if you look at our starting five, we might be uh, one of the only teams in the, in the tournament that has five 1,000-point scores. I mean, Sule scored, I think, 2,400 points. You know, uh, Zach Fremantle, who's not with us, is also a 1,000-point scorer. So, you know, we have a bunch of different players that can score, but we've been unselfish from day one. You know, Desmond Claude, uh, when Zach was playing with us, certainly Jerome Hunter, they really bought into, you know, the, the, the team way, you know, sharing the ball, hitting the first open man, and, you know, when we play that style, when we're really clicking, um, you know, that, that's, that's the best version of our offense right there. And I, I think that's, it's a constant reminder of sharing the ball. Back the aisle to the left. Sean, if this is a dumb question, feel free to dismiss me. But um, 
in 09, when you guys lost to Pitt, it's only two days, that's not a lot of time, but were you able to watch the game, the Pitt game against Villanova, and were you pulling for the Panthers hard at that point? Uh, I don't, I can't remember. It's like uh, once you get kicked out of the tournament, Mike, it's like you just kind of go dark for a couple days, you know? Um, but clearly I would have been pulling for Pitt and Jamie, uh, I think as much because of my fondness for him as, you know, uh, the place that I went to school. We'll go to the right side, Coach. Uh, Coach Jason Williams with Cincinnati Inquirer. You seem to be thoroughly enjoying this. Was there a time before you and Xavier reconnected where you thought maybe you'd never be back on the stage? For sure. Um, you know, I, I didn't know what the future held, uh, you know, I guess a year ago, year and a half ago now. Uh, but grateful for the opportunity. Um, and when given the opportunity, you really want to take advantage of it. You want to deliver. And, you know, you want to do some of the things that you thought about doing when you no longer had a team. And, uh, you know, I think from my perspective, I'm really at peace. A lot of the things that, that I wanted to do, that we, that we wanted to do as a coaching staff, you know, we were able to implement. And, you know, being that we're in our first year together, my hope is that those things grow. You know, playing a style on offense that's faster, that features, you know, a lot of passing and, and uh, team play. And, you know, I think something that, you know, is going to have to be prevalent in tomorrow's game is our defense has to keep improving as well. But this, this tournament is special. And uh, to not acknowledge it, you're, just, you're missing, you're missing a, a big part of, of, of what you do for a living. So I'm really, again, happy to be here and, you know, Hopeful we can we can we can stay that we can play really well and have a chance to beat a very good Pitt team tomorrow. Last question, back of the room. Coach Pitt is a team that really enjoys playing out in transition and they love running and playing fast. What, in your opinion, is the biggest key to stopping a team that likes to run up and down the floor like that at such a fast rate? Well, it starts when we have the ball. We have to run great offense. We have to share it, and we cannot turn it over. You know, if you cut down turnovers, you have a better opportunity to get back, and you're right. When you have that much firepower uh, on, on, from the perimeter that Pitt does, they're going to be at their best when the ball moves and they're in transition. So we got a dose of that yesterday playing Kennesaw, and we didn't necessarily pass that test throughout the game. You know, a big reason why we found ourselves in trouble is that very thing right there. End of the first half, we came unglued, had four turnovers, that led to several three-point shots in transition. And uh, you know, I, I think it was a great test for us to learn from so that when we play Pitt that we can get back. Getting our defense set is a big, big deal in tomorrow's matchup. OK, thank you, Coach. Yeah, yeah, they, they don't even know, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> On deck will be the Pitt Panthers. Again, a reminder that Hammond Communications will be will post a recording of this press conference and all the others in the NCAA Digital Media Hub that can be found at www.ncaa.veritone.com. Veritone.com.
starting at 220. We'll be starting shortly with Pittsburgh. They'll be bringing, bringing Blake Hinson, Jamarius Burton, and Nike Sabande. And they are here. Okay, we're scheduled here for 20 minutes with the student athletes from Pittsburgh. Again, reminder, raise your hand. Let us know who you're affiliated with, your name. Wait for the handheld mic. And uh, reminder that recording the press conference on cell phones or cameras is prohibited. And we will start with our first question on the aisle. Chris Carter, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, Jamari, this team, this Xavier team plays a lot different than the last two teams you guys have played. But as you said before, playing in the ACC, you guys are used to playing different teams. How do you guys switch from playing a team that plays at a different pace and against now one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country? Yeah, definitely. Um, like you said, they're one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country percentage-wise. They have a, a lot of different guys who can shoot the basketball, so there's going to be you know, some guys that we're going to have to respect on the floor as opposed to other opponents. Alex Randall, Pitt Student Radio. I asked this question to Nelly in the locker room yesterday, but this is a time of year where areas of the country are learning about teams that they haven't known about all year long. What do you want the natural or national audience that's going to watch you guys on CBS tomorrow, what do you want those guys to know about this team? We'll start from right to left. Blake? Uh, we really want to win, and um, we're just a humble and hungry group. Nike? Um, I would say we just, you know, play hard. We come out and we're going to compete every, every day in every possession. And we uh, ultimately want to win every game we play in there. Jamarius. And um, I would just say that um, for our group, we're just connected. And you can see that connectivity on the floor um, with our tight huddles, you know, the way we interact with each other and, you know, our just competitive spirit from coaching staff down. Middle of the room. Jim Hammett, PantherLair.com. Guys, do you feel that playing on Tuesday sort of kind of gave you guys a leg up tomorrow and kind of allowed you to get off to that 22 to two start? Jamaris? I would just say um, for us, it just allowed us to get our feet wet in this tournament. Um, you know, it allowed us to um, get comfortable, you know, with 
what's what's going to be going down as far as you know one game happening from Tuesday and you know having to travel so it's something that we've been able to pick up on uh, and um, it's helped us definitely Nike uh, yes I would say it definitely helped us uh, you know it, Playing Tuesday, you know, we got our, like like Jamaria said, we got our feet wet. We was able to, uh, you know, uh, go out and compete and uh, come out with a win. So I feel like uh, it definitely helped us for these uh, last games. For sure. Blake. For sure, felt the same exact way. I was very thankful for the um, playing game, being able to play, playing against a really good team at that and really got, you know, your feet wet, just like Jamaria said. Chris Carter, Post Gazette. Uh, this is for all the guys. You guys haven't, uh, since you guys started tournament play, you guys haven't made uh, more than 10 three-pointers in a game yet, and that was really a big part of a lot of you guys' biggest wins this season. Is that a hidden element you think that is ready to burst out, or how do you see that factoring in just the way that you guys have won so far? Yeah, I mean, for us, we feel like we haven't even played our best basketball yet, and that's a big component of the way we play, and we've been playing all season is, you know, being able to be dominant from the three-point line. And, you know, we got some marksmen um, that haven't really um, got it going yet, but we we look um, forward to, you know, those three balls going down in the near future. Nike? Um, I think it just shows uh, our versatility. Uh, we're a very versatile group. Um, we, we like like he said, we haven't so we had some markmen that hasn't been able to you know get hot yet. But it shows that we can we can still get wins and still fight without making those shots and without making uh ten plus twelve threes a game. So it just shows our versatility. Blake, right? I mean, I think I think it's, it shows a lot about our versatility as well. Um, teams are gonna play us how they play us. They know the same things you guys know. You know what I mean? So they're gonna try their best to stop that. So. Being able to be versatile and switch it up and still win is what's big to me. Middle of the room. Jim Hammett, PantherLayer.com. You know, in that second half, Nelly came up and he had the first six points of the second half. He's been hitting a lot of big shots in both these games. How important has he been and what's his demeanor like on the court in these games? Jamaris? Yeah, I would just say Nelly's a competitor. You know, when when he comes into the game aggressive, we feed off his energy. And, um, you know, he started off the half last game on a roll, and we definitely fed off that energy and was able to keep it going. Nike. Um, I would say the same thing, man. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a dog. He's going to come out. He's going to fight. Uh, he's been here before. He's been in a tournament before. He knows how it feels to make big shots. So um, he, he's been doing his thing, and uh, we look forward to continue to keep it going. Blake? Yeah, dog. Um, it's all about, he's all from Pittsburgh, all about what Pittsburgh represents, man. Just real doggy dude. And that's just, we feed off that. That's the, he one of us, yeah. To our left. Hey guys, Steve Reed from Associated Press. Um, as, as one of the other guys saying, it's, it's the first time for a lot of people around the country seeing teams and really getting a close look at guys. When you, when you, when people see the uh, Diaz Graham brothers, um, they look and they see two seven foot guys that are, look exactly the same, same haircut, <laughs> wiry frame. Um, I'm just, can, can you tell us a little bit about them and, and do you guys ever mistake them for each other or do you guys kind of know right away? I mean, I, I would say at first, you know, it took us some time to, you know, figure out um, which one was which, but uh, at first it started with, you know, we know one of them was wearing a different pair of shoes, but you know, as we got to know them and um, you know, be around them more. We've able to, you know, pick them apart and um, just speak a little bit about them. They're fearless, and you can kind of see that with their play on the floor. Nike, man, uh, yeah, them, them, they're the twin towers, man. Uh, <laughs> it was, it definitely was a, a tough distinction trying to figure them out. You know, early in the season, like figuring them out, like what's what's the difference between them. But um, man, they they fearless. They're gonna fight. We love them. Uh, we embrace him, man. Uh, Jorge's actually my roommate, um, so so I actually, you know, had some close talks and good talks with him, and got to, you know, actually learn learn about him more. He, from, you know, from Spain, he tells me stuff about how he uh, lived over there. You know how it was, um, man. They just a uh, they just uh, really good people, and they love to play this game. They love the game, man, for sure. Blake. Um. I want to point out what JV said about them being fearless. I mean, they're clearly talented, but um. What makes them come in these games and produce is the fearlessness. And as much as I would love to take credit for that, 
um, we found them like that. So that's <laughs> that's just great. I mean, we found a little piece of us all the way in Spain. So like, <laughs> for sure, like I, it's really good credit. I mean, a lot of credit to them, but I think there's a lot more that they got to show y'all. Back of the room, uh, Alex Randall, Pit Radio again. Uh, speaking of the Diaz Graham twins, Jeff has talked all year long about how you guys have encouraged them, you guys have built them up. Um, what has it been like? Talk about the pride you guys feel when you see a game like yesterday in which Guillermo goes off, Jorge gets him a great pass for a dunk. How are you guys feeling when you see that on the court? I mean, for me, it just, you know, brings so much joy to my face, you know, because I see them each and every day in the gym putting in the work. And when you see hard work pays off, it just brings a level of excitement, you know, for me and the group. Mikey? Yeah, I agree, man. Uh, they, they, they work their tails off. You know, they stay in the, uh, stay in the gym. Um, I think anytime they, you know, they got a connected connectivity with each other and with, with our group, man. They just play so fearless. And, and uh, man, it, it's amazing having them playing with us. And, you know, we, we, we put the battery in their backs, too. You know, when they, when they put their heads down, when they, you know, sometimes they put their heads down, we pick them up. Like, come on, let's go, man. We, you, you got it. So, um, they're really good players. They're very talented, and I think they got a lot, of, lot to show as well. Blake? Yeah, yeah, just like JB said again, it really makes you smile and appreciate what hard work does because they're really basketball guys. Like, you know, freshmen in college, you would, ex you would expect partying and all that. But if I'm being honest, I don't think that. I haven't heard one of those stories from them all year. Yeah. So um, the only thing I know about them is they're always in the gym. And I know they could play with each other with their, with their eyes on a blindfold. So, like, they're really good. They're really all about basketball. And that type of stuff shows when they get their opportunity. Back left. Um, Richie Schmahowski from the Pitt News. Um, obviously, having Federico back yesterday, it seemed like, you know, it helped to take some of the stress off of Guillermo for as good as he's been playing. But just as a team, what does it mean to have him back? And what sort of spark does he provide to the lineup? Yeah, I mean, it means a lot. You know, we wouldn't be here without Federico Federico. Um, he's been our anchor all year. And um, for us, it just, you know, it brings a level of joy to see him back there on the, on the floor with us. And, you know, he does so many things that don't show up on a stat sheet. And, um, you know, just having him out there again like yesterday was big. Nike? Man, I agree, man. Uh, Fetty, he's a force. Uh, you know, obviously everybody knows you've been dealing with the injury. So, um, you know, to get him back on the floor, man, it just it shows a testament to his character and who he is as a person, man. He, you know, persevered through that and, and was able to come out and impact the game at a very high level. And uh, like, like Jamaria said, we wouldn't be here without Fetty. So um, he's, he's been great for us all year for sure. Blake? I'm going to be the third person to say it. We wouldn't be here without Federico. And um, just like Nike said, it really shows his character to – want to still go out here and play. I mean, he's done amazing things this year. Uh, he can really just sit down and be like, I did it, you know what I mean? But like, even in practice, we're like, Fetty, you can sit down. And he's like, no, I want to I want to do it. It's like, no, you need to sit down. So he wants to play in practice games. He wants to do walkthroughs. He still wants to do everything. So we're trying to protect him from himself. Like, <laughs> he really, really, really wants to be out there with us. And we see it. And um, what the fans did for him was really appropriate. Back of the room. Amanda Gotze, Johnstown Tribune Democrat. Um, I noticed last night in Nelly's post-game interview, he used the phrase humble and hungry. Then I saw in the locker room last night, it was written on the whiteboard, humble and hungry, one and oh. Has that become a mantra for you guys? And when did you sort of adopt it? Yeah, I mean, we've had that mantra all year. You know, coach, make sure that we stay even keel even when we have success. And that's where the humble and hungry comes from. Yeah, that's that's definitely something we preached uh, we preached on all year. Uh, Coach stayed in our ear about you know staying, like he said, even killed through all the highs and the lows that we went through all season. Um, you know, keeping our eyes on our prize and just really staying in the moment, man. Staying in, uh, locking in, on taking that next step. He always talks about you know just taking the next necessary step, not thinking you know too far ahead or or thinking you know two games ahead, man. We just trying to you know attack the day and attack the next game for sure. Blake. Yeah, um, humble and hungry, just like we said, is what we want to stay on. But one and oh is what I want to speak on. We're always trying to be one and oh every day. Um, I mean, of course, on game day, but like one and oh, like even today in practice, we trying to win that day. 
And then when we get to the game, we're trying to be one to know. We're not thinking about anything else for it. We're thinking about the next step in front of us. In front of me on the aisle. Chris Carter, Post Gazette. Uh, Blake, Xavier's head coach and pit alum, Sean Miller, calls you an X factor for this team. Do you feel like you're an X factor for the, you're the X factor for the team? And what does that mean when you hear an opposing coach? You know, he talked about the importance of making sure that you are a big part of their game plan. I mean, I'm I'm a piece of the puzzle. Um, that's all I can say. You can call it whatever type of factor S X L factor, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate the compliment, though, but um, I'm just a piece of the puzzle, man. I work well with these guys. I've been on three different teams. I've never been called the X Factor. You know what I mean? So, like, I work well with these guys. That's what I would call it. Uh, Alex Randall, Pitt Radio. I wanted to ask you guys about the more off-court relationships you guys have with this team. You see warming up, uh, Blake, you and KJ with your little football move and then you're running off the court with a lot of joy seeing you guys in the locker room it's very clear this group likes being around each other talk about how that was cultivated this year and what that means to you guys as you progress through this tournament Blake I don't know I think that's the special part about it though just like I said I really think um Jorge and Guillermo is a lot like us and they're from the other side of the planet and I, like he's from Indy I'm cool with him. We ain't never got we we sit right next to him in the locker room. We ain't never had no problems. JB, he's probably the only Southern dude on the team besides me, and um the whole locker room just gels. And I I don't know what that is. I think that's just God's plan. Mikey, um, I I give credit credit to the coaches, man. They did a great job, you know, putting this group together. Um, and it's just crazy, man. Like like he said, you know, um, we really it's it's really like natural for us, man. We really never had no problems as a as a unit. We all jail together. We're close. Uh, we you know um, we we all really like each other, man, and we stick together. You know, um, we fight together, and uh, we're locked in for sure. And then for me, I would just say that you know this group does a great job with communicating with one another. You know, through the ups and downs, we're always you know not afraid to have those tough conversations, those tough team meetings, and, and really, you know, um, laying our hearts on the table, you know, for one another. And I think that's been key for us, you know, staying together all season long. Back of the room. Hey, guys, Corey Chris and DK Pittsburgh Sports. Nike, this is for you. I was just talking to Greg in the locker room. He said he called the Fairleigh Dickinson upset over Purdue. I just need to know, because he told me to specifically ask you, I just need to know if it's true, number one, Number two, if he called it before the game started, <laughs> and then in a general sense, <laughs> <laughs> and then in a general sense, how much have you guys been able to watch the rest of the tournament that's going on? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Greg actually did call that out. He did. Uh, we we both did. We thought it, we knew it was going to be a good game. We knew because we played fairly Dickinson. We know they they got really good guards, you know, and they play like a good five out offense. So uh, we knew it was going to be you know an interesting game with Purdue's. Um, you know, big man that they have. So, um, yeah, he did call it out, man. Uh, and it's crazy that, that that was a huge upset, man. That was a crazy game. And um, as far as, you know, the rest of the tournament, man, I think it's exciting. It's just, it just shows, you know, a lot of great teams in this conference, you know, to make it to continue to play in March, man. It just shows that all these teams are good, you know. Any other questions? Fourth row. Blake, I noticed whenever he was asking that question, you kind of rolled your eyes about uh, Greg's prediction. Do you have any any rebuttal on that? I, I don't. I mean, to be totally honest with you, I remember playing him. I remember being challenged, for sure. Um, I wasn't there when he predicted this. I figured I would be around when that happened, so I guess I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, but to be if, now, I'm going to end on this statement. If I was to see the video of the coach saying I want Purdue to see this, I didn't see that video before the game. If I was to see that, I probably would have predicted it too because that's a lot of confidence. So, you know, shout out to them. Both programs, that was a great game, and that was a great win. Anyone else? Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you.
Reminder, the Pittsburgh locker room is still open. It'll be open until uh, Coach Capel concludes his press conference up here, which should run from 2.40 to 3 o'clock. So we'll start up here in a couple minutes. Okay, we're about ready to coach to start with Coach Cable. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll start with questions. All right. Okay, questions. We'll be here at 20 minutes with Coach Capel. First question, fourth row. Jim Hammett, PantherLayer.com. Coach, I wanted to ask about uh, Nellie Cummings in that uh, sequence after halftime where he comes up with two big buckets. I think he had 11 of his 13 points in the second half. What's his demeanor been like uh, in these two tournament games? Well, Nellie's very confident. Um, he probably has the most experience in the NCAA tournament of anyone on our team. And he's always played well in the tournament. If you look back at his time in Colgate, uh, in the games that they played in the NCAA tournament, he played very well. Uh, Nelly's a really confident young man. Uh, we have a lot of confidence in him. Um, we know that he can go on some spurts where he can put the ball in the basket. Uh, he's done that all year, and we have a lot of confidence in him to do that. To our right. Jeff, Josh Graham, WSJS. Um, 
we you obviously played FDU and they upset Purdue last night. That's now two 16 seeds and five tournaments that have won when previously it hadn't happened before. Three straight tournaments, we've seen a 15 seed beat a two. Do you have a theory on why we're seeing more upsets by some of these lower seeds in recent years? I just think there's more parity in college basketball. I think you're going to continue to see that uh, with, with, with guys transferring, um, with these teams being older. Um, and just I, I just think the parity in college basketball is so much greater than it was maybe 10 years ago. Uh, Chris, Chris Carter, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Jeff, you guys have been a team that's kind of been able to morph the way you play to your opponents, and you kind of did that with the last two teams. But this Xavier team is one of the best three-point shooting teams in the country. What are the challenges you guys have to lock in on to be ready for them? Yeah, well, this is a completely different style um, than we've played the last two games. Both teams we've played, uh, Mississippi State and Iowa State, have been very, very good defensively and not as good offensively. This is a different level. Xavier is good defensively, but they're really good offensively. And so our mindset has to change. Our game plan will change, and we have to be able to go out and execute it against a really, really talented team. Back to the room. Jeff Corey Christen, DK Pittsburgh Sports. With the way Guillermo has played throughout this week, Mississippi State and Iowa State, does that make things at least a little bit more challenging in terms of Federico's knee injury and him coming back from that and maybe divvying up the minutes and even going as far as to deciding who's going to start between the two? I don't think it makes it challenging. Not at all. I mean, uh, one of the great things about our group and especially those two guys is that they're probably each other's biggest cheerleader. And so I don't, I don't think it's, it's a challenge or an issue at all. Back left, all the way in the back. Alex Randall, Pitt Radio. Jeff, you talked about how Xavier has a lot of uh, defensive ability, but perhaps even more on offense. Obviously, that's going to impact you on the defensive end. Does that impact how your team looks at offense as well in a tournament where you've scored less than your season average the first two games? Yeah, well, the first two teams we've played, they've been really, really physical defensively. And their ball screen coverages have been very, very um, aggressive. In watching tape of Xavier, they're really good defensively, but it's very different. They, they haven't played with the same physicality, at least I haven't seen on tape. They may do that tomorrow. They, they're very physical, but it's different. Their ball screen coverage is very different. You know, I think they're at their best, Xavier, when they're forcing turnovers and getting out in transition. They are a dynamic transition offensive team whether you score off of missed shots and especially off of turnovers. So it's going to be imperative for us to really value the basketball and make sure we're getting quality shots every time. Front left. Uh, Jerry DePaul of Pittsburgh. Uh, Jeff, can you talk about a little bit about the process of recruiting the Twins uh, from, from the outset? And uh, when did you first start to be able to tell them apart? <laughs> um, the process of recruiting them, that really started uh, with Tim O'Toole, going down to IMG, we heard about him. He went down there and saw him, uh, thought they were good enough. And so that really started the process of our recruitment. That probably happened in the fall uh, or early winter of last year. And uh, that started the communication with them. Um, they came on their official visit after the season was over with. And I'll be honest with you, probably in all of my years of, of being involved in this as a head coach or an assistant coach, it's right up there with the greatest official visit I've ever been a part of. Um, it was the twins, their families, their family, uh, their mom and dad and their spouses. The mom and dad are not together, but man, they're like spouses. Their new spouses are best friends. I mean, it was unbelievable. It, it was really great. And just the energy was so positive. Um, and when they came here, they went, when, once they left our place, they actually went to separate places to go visit some other schools separately. I think we were one of the few schools that was recruiting them together. Um, and then fortunately, we were able to get them. Um, and so, but that what started the process. And to be honest with you, I can't tell them apart. Um, the, here's the way I can tell them apart. In practice, one of them wears yellow shoes, one of them wears white. And then off the court, Guillermo has an earring, Jorge doesn't. It's the only way I can tell them apart. 
Back of the room. I don't know if I could follow that up with any question that would uh, make this work, but I'll try. Jeff, um, Coach Miller, obviously former Pitt player, spent really good seasons playing for tournament teams in the late 80s, early 90s at Pitt. I mean, I just curious what the relationship is between you and him. And when you look back at those 80s and 90s teams, you know, what stands out to you about Coach Miller as a player when you see, saw him play at Pitt? Yeah, well, I remember uh, Sean as a player when he played at Pitt. Um, I remember, if I'm not mistaken, and some of you, you know, from around Pittsburgh probably know this better than me. I think Sean was like on, you know, as, as a young kid on high school with dribbling and ball handling and things like that. Obviously, he comes from an outstanding basketball family with his father being a great coach um, in the Pittsburgh area. And it was a big deal when Sean went to Pitt. He was a four-year starter, a really, really good player. Uh, a part got the assist on the most famous play ever at University of Pittsburgh and one of the greatest plays ever in college basketball history. Um, you know, he's a pit man. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's been an outstanding coach. You know, I remember him as an assistant coach at NC State when I played for Herb Sendak. Um, and, you know, you knew then just watching him on the sideline, watching the passion and the fiery demeanor that he had and, you knew that he was destined to be a really good coach. And he's done that at every place that he's been. He's been an outstanding coach. Back to the room. Um, Richie Schmahowski, the Pitt News. Coach, I'm just curious a little bit on the preparation that goes into March Madness games specifically because there's so little time in between games. Um, how do you sort of expedite the process of preparing for a team? And are there any other teams that you can use in, that you've played this year that would sort of compare similarly to the way that Xavier does? Yeah, well, how we go about the process um, is, you know, when we played yesterday uh, before our game, Xavier and Kennesaw State played, we've already divided that up where two assistants are there live scouting the game. One of them has already been watching Xavier. The other one's already been watching Kennesaw. So whoever wins, we already have a good feel. They already have a good feel. I didn't watch any. I watched some of the game sitting back there waiting for our game. Um, and then last night, once we won, then we immediately started the preparation. You know, we get back um, as a staff, we get together and we start talking about Xavier. We start watching, you know, there's a, you know, preview already for me where I can get a feel for them, where they've cut up some edits some tapes, what they like to do offensively, what they like to do defensively, what are their strengths, what are some areas perhaps we could attack or we, we should try to attack. I spent... A lot of time uh, last night, early morning, watching them, watching games, you know, making my notes, which I normally, all, which I always do. Watched them again this morning. We met as we met last night as a team. We gave them a preview of them. We met this morning. We went over scouting, went over personnel. Um, we'll go out here and practice, you know, for a little bit. We'll get together again tonight to try to finalize our game plan. Since we're at noon tomorrow, um, it's an early game, you know, so to be an early morning where we'll get up, uh, we'll walk through some stuff in the morning and then get over here and play. And as far as the – look, I'm, I don't like to compare, man. I, I don't – you know, I heard so much for the – before we played Iowa State that we were like Baylor. I, I don't like to do that. I don't like to compare other teams to other teams or someone we played. Xavier is Xavier. They are really good. They've had an outstanding season, um, and they've earned the right to be in this position, to be a three-seed. I mean, they're a really good basketball team, and it's going to be a big-time challenge for us. Back of the room. Alex Randall, Pitt Radio. Coach, I asked the players a little bit ago about the off-the-court connection that this team shares. Uh, I believe it was Blake that credited the coaching staff with cultivating a lot of that closeness. How can you – what do you, what can you tell us about the way this team has gelled, especially considering a lot of these guys are new to each other at the start of the year? Well, I think the main thing is that we, 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 um, it happened organically. I don't know what we did as a coaching staff different from what we've done or attempted to do in previous years, and that's just being completely honest. Um, we have some guys that are a little bit older um, that are over themselves. Our guys have egos, but they don't have ego problems. Like, they believe in who they are. And I think the pieces just fit. And I think it all happened organically. I think once we got everyone together, they started to see how the pieces fit. And the relationships just happened. 
we talked about the same things we've talked about uh, from the first day I took over the job is be a really good teammate. Care about someone other than yourself. Appreciate what we have. All of those things, it's really resounded with these guys. And I think it's because the maturity that we have um, and because the pieces just fit. Sure, right? Especially since your alma mater is about the tip in the next few minutes. I'm just curious, how much of the tournament, when you're coaching in it, do you get to see on, on practice days or even on game days as things are going on? And related to Duke, haven't had a chance to catch you since John won last week in Greensboro. How satisfying is it to see Coach step away and somebody win an ACC championship and also win an NCAA tournament game a couple days ago? Well, as far as watching the games, I mean, I'll, I'll watch bits and pieces. Um, you know, I'll normally have it on as I'm watching tape. And normally when I'm watching film of, of, of our opponent, I normally have the volume down on that. And I'll have the game on in the background. And if it sounds like it's getting exciting, I'll take a peek. Last night I watched the Fairleigh Dickinson as that happened against Purdue. I watched some of that, especially down the stretch. I actually shut my computer down, just closed it just to watch some of that. Um, but my focus is on our team. That's it. I'm trying to help our guys put us in the best position for us to have success. Um, as far as Duke, look, I'm, I'm happy for them. You know, they're running their own race. You know, John's done an incredible job this year, and I, I wish them luck. Back of the room. Amanda Godsey, John Sound Tribune Democrat. Uh, Jeff, I saw, uh, I heard Nelly last night in his post-game interview say, mentioned the phrase humble and hungry, and then I saw it in the whiteboard on the locker room. It said humble and hungry, one and oh. Um, I asked uh, the team about it today, and they all credited you with having that mantra and keeping them even keeled. And uh, how important do you think it's been to just have that uh, steady state through the highs and the lows of the season? I think it's really, really important. And I think that's an area where perhaps I've grown as a coach, and I've gotten maybe a little bit better with that. Um, I remember my dad used to always say the highs can't be the highs aren't can't be too high. The lows are never as low as you think they are. You have it's somewhere right in the middle. And as I've gotten older, I think I understand that a little bit better. Um, our guys have done an incredible job of that. The leadership on our team has done an incredible job of that. We'll be in timeouts and things will be hectic. And I hear them saying, "Let's get back to neutral. Let's get back to neutral." And so, and the theme we've had all year is just try to be one and know. Not to look ahead, not look behind us, but concentrate on the next step, what's right in front of us. And our guys have done a pretty good job of that. Chris Carter, Post Gazette. Uh, Jeff, Jamarius was just telling us he feels that you guys haven't played your best game yet. Um, but, you know, both Blake, him, and Nike all said versatility is important in being able to change your style of play. But they talked about not, you know, they, you know being, they haven't had the game where they've shot the lights out from three-pointers the way you guys have in your best wins. How do you guys key in an opportunity? What does it say about you guys that you have one without that so far? Yeah, well, I think it shows the resiliency and the toughness of our team. Um, I was asked a question at halftime of the Mississippi State game. You know, we made eight threes in the first half. And how do you win if you don't? make threes in the second half. And my answer was, I don't want to think about it. You know, hopefully we make three, but we didn't. We made one, but we were still able to find a way to win. I think our league helped prepare us for that. Again, playing against all the different styles that we faced, I think it helped us for that. And just going through a season when you're resilient, you're tough, you're together, you're able to adapt and figure out different ways. And this team has been able to do that all year. Back of the room. Jeff, you've at times called Nike a six starter, and obviously he's won the six man of the year award for the ACC, but how do you see his game evolving, not just from the standpoint of being able to come off the bench and provide instant offense, but from being more a complete basketball player throughout this stretch run? Yeah, well, I think he's done probably an even better job defensively. I think he rebounds well. Um, he's able to attack, obviously, his scoring, but I just think his game has become more well-rounded uh, throughout the years he's been there with us. Um, I think he understands the impact he can have besides just scoring. Um, and that's growth. That's growth as a player. That's accepting, you know, your role. That's accepting and, and just learning about the game, just learning about the game of basketball. So many young people think 
you have to have the ball in order to be able to have impact. The reality is in a 40-minute game, even the best player probably doesn't have, if you think about how much time you actually have the basketball in your hand, it's not that much. Um, but there's so many different ways you can impact the game. If you cut hard, that can impact the game. If you screen hard, if you talk, if you don't get screened, if you help. I mean, just all these different things. And I think over time, Nike has understood and learned those different facets about the game. We have about two more minutes. Next question. Chris Carter, Post-Gazette. Uh, Jeff, I know you talked about you know, the preparation process, especially for Xavier. Greg's a guy who's played Xavier a lot. Did he, how much did he contribute or how much did he offer as far as what you guys have been talking about since your win? And what's he like just and how he embraces your scouting reports and helps you guys prepare? Well, Greg's mature. He's been around, so he's able, like Nelly, like JB, those guys understand the importance of scouting personnel and things like that. Um, you know, it's, it's different. He's played Xavier, but he hadn't played Sean Miller's Xavier. And so it's different. I think their style of play, the things that they do are very different from the previous coaching staff that Greg played against. Last question, back of the room. Jeff, Corey, Chris, and DK Pittsburgh Sports. The fan support in Dayton was tremendous. You talked about that after, but when the fans were able to travel again for yesterday's game, and they'll certainly be here again tomorrow. Just what was that like having that kind of support in, a, in an arena that you're also familiar with playing in? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, it really was. Um, our fans have been outstanding all season long, especially, you know, after Christmas, once we got back, once the students got back. Um, I think there is, a, I think there has been an unbelievable connection all year with this team and the fans, the students in the city of Pittsburgh. I, I think there's been a great connection. It's been really cool to see. We're grateful. We are grateful for it. We're going to need them tomorrow. Um, and hopefully they show out in droves. Thanks, Jeff. We'll see you tomorrow. Right. Good job. Yeah. Uh, he's with his grandparents. Yeah, go, go ahead. Who can you do it next? We'll just we'll just work with one of them. Okay, we're scheduled to start at three ten with the student athletes from Kentucky.
Okay, we're about to start with the student athletes from Kentucky. They'll be bringing Oscar Shibwe, Chris Livingston, and Kaysen Wallace. Wallace, right there. I'm new to this guy. Yeah, put your names there to make it easier. Yeah, easy with them. Okay, we have 20 minutes with the student athletes from Kentucky. We have from my right, Oscar Shibwe, Chris Livingston, and Kaysen Wallace. Please remind everybody, please put your uh, cell phone, silence your cell phones. Uh, we hand out the handheld mics. Let, raise your hand, let us know who you are, who you're with and recording these press conferences on cell phones or cameras is prohibited. We have 20 minutes, and the uh, Kentucky locker room is also open. Who has the first question? Third row right in front of me. John Huang, NOLA Media. Chris and Kaysen, when you see Oscar start the game just rebounding like crazy, what's going through your mind? I mean, you see him in practice all the time, but to see him come up in a big game situation like that, what did that do to the mindset of the team? Chris. Um, it's definitely something we came accustomed to seeing from um, Oscar, you know, rebounding the ball very well, coming out with a lot of energy, high intensity. Um, and we knew that coach emphasized rebounding, you know, going against uh, um, Providence. And he emphasized that, you know, the teams that really bothered them, out rebounded them by a large margin. So. We knew we had to do that in the game. Oscar, you know, started off right, so we just wanted to match that energy. Kaysen? Uh Like Chris said, like, it just brought a lot of energy to the team, you know, seeing Oscar be Oscar and get all those rebounds. Um, brought a little confidence to our shooting a little bit, knowing that if we miss it, we get another chance with Oscar down there cleaning it up. Third row. Oscar, Tyler Thompson from Kentucky Sports Radio. Last night, Keontae Johnson told us that he reached, or you reached out to him after his medical episode when he collapsed and you two were friends. Can you tell us about your friendship? Um, yes, um, he's my boy. I knew him since high school. So when he went through everything, so I just reached out to him and I told him, I'm keeping you in my prayer. Let's keep praying. Let's just keep trusting in God. God is gonna bring you better than you were before. So that's how our, our friendship is good. We reach out sometimes, check up on him once in a while to see how he's doing. Cal Schraubenet here with the Kansas City Stars. Questions for Oscar. Um, Kansas State doesn't have a traditional center. Their bigs are a little bit more agile, more, more of a stretch four. When you go up against guys like that who like to play in the perimeter and inside, how do you change your approach defensively? Um, they are really good. They are really good. They're big. Um, he's doing a lot of things to help their team. Um, he's just going to come in, be ready to play, because um, to watch their film, to watch the film, what they are doing, like, um, it's a team that is really good. I'm just going to come in. We have a team playing. How are we going to play? How are we going to play them? So now I'll be ready for tomorrow, too. Middle of the room. Alec Bossi, uh Rivals. Oscar, this one's for you. You're obviously a great rebounder, but when you're in the air, how much do you try and use your body to create space against other players that are also going for rebounds? And how much does that help you? I help a lot. Um, um, first thing is uh, I read the ball most of the time, and I position myself where I, my, the ball, sometimes I don't need to jump. It's just going to come in my hands. It needs a lot of effort and a lot of fights. But I use my body a lot when I'm jumping to put in some people, bikes up, so I can get a rebound. I use my body a lot. Third row. Yeah, for, for all of you guys, Coach Cal has really emphasized the importance of just relaxing and enjoying the moment. How are you guys doing this during this this tournament? Are you watching any of the games? What are you doing for, for relaxation? Start far right, Kaysen. Um, coach tell us not to watch the games because we don't know who we'll play and we don't, you know, we're playing our game. We got to worry about ourselves, but just being loose and free out there once the ball go up for tip off. So I feel like we're 
well prepared and we'll be ready. Chris? Uh, yeah, like you said, um, Coach tried to emphasize, you know, not really watching other, any other games or worrying about, you know, what's going on elsewhere, but just worrying about what we got to handle and what's in front of us. So I think we did a really good job of, you know, staying locked in, you know, not being nervous and playing free. And now that we got that one game under our belt, I think it's going to be, you know, good for us to carry that into the next game. Oscar. Um, you just uh, make us to stay away from watching those games because sometimes by you watching a game, you start getting nervous. So you just make us create some fun game for ourselves. Make us to stay away from phone, to stay focused, not let what is happening outside there affect us. So we're just going to come in and fight and get it like a lot of, lot of sleep because our body needs to rest to be ready for, what, for the game. Middle of the room. Blair Kirkhoff with the Kansas City Star. This is for Kaysen and Chris. I wanted to get your guys' impressions of Kansas State and what film study has told you about that team. Kaysen. Uh They're a great team. They have a nice guard. He has the ball a lot. And, you know, that's one of my matchups. So I know he's a great player. He can shoot it well. He gets to the rack. He's nice, he good at facilitating. So uh, I have my hands full. Chris. Um, yeah, like you said, I think they're a really, really good team. You know, I've been watching them throughout the season, you know, seeing the success that they had. Um, they're really aggressive, you know, and they have um, Johnson, um, the wing on the other team is a really good, um, really good wing. You know, he's aggressive, he gets downhill, and he's really strong. And he also can play out the mid-range area pretty well. So, you know, we've done a, I think we've done a great job of scouting the team and um, understanding our matchups. We understand that we have a, you know, a big-time matchup ahead of us. Third row. So this is for all of you guys. Last night, your teammates told us about the TikTok game that you were playing at the team dinner that had everybody laughing a lot. One, can you tell us about the game? And two, do you think John Calipari could play it? Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> that game, I still, I'm, I told them to teach me. I'm still learning. I don't know how that game works. So they're the one, they be playing the game. So I'm enjoying, I'm just recording and have fun, see them playing that game. So they might explain better. Chris, teach us all. Um, <laughs> all right, so basically in the game, it's like a shadow boxing game. So like you point a certain direction and the person goes that way, you get a point for that. So it's like you got to like predict where the person's head is going to go. And it's like, I think we've just been playing that for a little minute. But yeah, it's a little fun game. Kaysen? Kakao play it. <laughs> he actually played it today <laughs> yeah. he was during our practice. Yeah. Uh, talking about one of our teammates, but... Uh, would he be good at it? Probably not. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> I don't know if he can react, react fast enough. But. Third row. Going back, oh, Jeff Drummond with uh, Rivals. Going back to the question you received about um, paying attention to the task ahead of you, the game you have. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, last night you could hear any of the buzz going on in, in the arena while you guys were playing kind of reacting to other games. And if, if you're able to block that out, or do you hear them chanting FDU, FDU, and, and uh, going wild when a 16 seed defeats a one? Kaysen. Uh No, I didn't know about that. <laughs> Chris? I ain't even gonna lie, I definitely did hear a lot of like, it was just like out of nowhere, because it was coming out of a timeout, and it was just like a lot of like noise and stuff and chanting. But I didn't look at the screen or anything like that to worry about the other game because I was still focused on what was going on in our game. But I definitely noticed it. Oscar. Yeah, um, I hear the noise loud. People, I was confused to see the game is not going on. So how these people are screaming? Um, so I did not know. I was like confused a little bit. I said, no, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to focus in the game. So I, I did block my ears from pay attention and all those things. Third row, right in front of me. Okay, okay, we'll go to the back room. I'm sorry. Uh, Mitch Fortner came in Radio Manhattan for either one of you. You brought up Marquise Noel earlier, their guard number one. Have you guys seen a player like that ever very often, 5A point guard that can do so many things, deep threes to be unpredictable with the passing? Kaysen? Um, Not really. I mean... Some of the film that we watched today, I mean, he shot it a deep one, no rim, straight net. So seeing him shoot deep like that and get downhill, facilitating for his teammates, like, you know, not everybody can have skill like that. Chris? 
Um, yeah, like you said, I don't think we really um, have seen that throughout the season. Except probably one time we played um, South Carolina. The point guard for South Carolina, Michi Johnson, shot a, a few deep shots. But he, I think his um, point guard for Kansas State's range might be a little bit more further out. So I don't think we've really seen that before. Third row. There were a couple of issues with the rim during the pregame. Did you notice anything different about the rim? And, and do you like the way the, the rims are here? Oscar. Um, say it again, please. I did not get that. Yeah, during the pregame, they checked the rim on a couple of occasions, and there was a little bit of delay. And I didn't know if you noticed any difference in these rims, and, and how, do you, how do you like these rims here in, in Greensboro? I did not notice any different. Um, I just, we were coming out for warm up and I see they were fixing it. I did not know what was going on. I was just waiting until they finish so I, we can start and shooting. Chris? Uh, yeah, I didn't really pay that no mind. I just, you know, was ready to warm up, you know, waiting for, to get the, for them to get their job done. So I didn't really pay that no mind. Casey? Yeah, it didn't really affect us during the game. I mean, it gave us time to work on other things, ball handling. Other questions for the student athletes? Okay, thank you guys. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we should be joined by Coach Calipari at 3.30, which is about 10 minutes. And the uh, Kentucky locker room remains open. Reminder that Hammond Communications will post a recording of this press conference and all the press conferences in the NCAA Digital Media Hub, which is at www.ncaa.veritone.com. And reminder that the satellite is uh, Galaxy 17 K10 slot A 11886.5B. Okay, we'll be starting earlier. Coach is right here. Did you miss me? Okay, questions for Coach. Raise your hand. Let's get the handheld mic to you and let us know who you are, who you're with. John Darrell Burr with the Cats Paws in Lexington. Um, I guess we've probably gotten numb to watching Oscar do what he does, but there have been a lot of great rebounders. What does he do specifically that makes him the elite rebounder he is? Um, he's got a nose for the ball, and it's important to him that he goes and gets rebounds. Um, uh, he understands uh, positioning, where the ball will probably come off to, and then he goes up, and now he rebounds with two hands. When he gets both hands on it, it's hard to get it away from him. Our own players have figured that out. They go try to grab it, and he grabs it with two. It's like, you know, I'll tell a kid, I said, you got one rebound. He said he jerked three out of my hands. To our right. Yeah, John Clay, Lexington Air Leader. John, coming into the tournament, people were saying this is not a Calipari-like defensive team. Yet Ed Cooley said last night that you're, you guys were the best defense he's seen in a month. What did you do last night well defensively? Um, we, were, we were able to take away um, some of their things. I mean, the preparation was really good. Harder in a quick flip like this. It's just harder. And uh, now you've got to base it on principles. Uh, but the guys like Antonio, he's become a better defender. 
Um, uh, you know, I think the injuries and who we were playing affected our defense some. Um, rim protection. Again, we worked hard on what we're doing, even if Oscars, how are we playing? How are we cracking down? We, you know, you just work on it every day. I mean, we're, we're still coaching, still teaching, still giving these guys, building them up, giving them hope, belief. I mean, but a lot of it is you have more confidence when you're playing the right way. I believe Antonio Reeves is shooting the ball better because he's a better defender now. And you get clubbed seven times, you think you're going to go down and be confident and make a shot? Kid's defending better. Jacob's defending better, playing tougher. Oscar still stands behind the post sometimes. I don't – kid, what, do you, why, what don't you understand? And Damian got in and tipped that ball away. That was a big play. So – and then rebounding, it's not just one guy because Jacob and um, uh, Chris Livingston – are rebounding the ball well, too. Middle of the room. Coach, Kellis Robinette here with the Kansas City Star. Um, Jerome Tang, after last night's game, said he would go back and draw on some of the experience he had coaching against you when he was an assistant at Baylor. Um, I was wondering if you maybe thought Jeez, back to he can remember that? He, he was I very can't remember. Uh, you know what I remember? An ice storm in Dallas, and the game before us, we said, let's have the women play, and then we'll play. Four overtimes later, we started the game at midnight, and it was an ice storm. We almost couldn't get out, almost couldn't get to the game. So that's what I remember. The rest of it I don't remember. Okay. What, what kind of it stands out to you about the way he coaches and the team he has right He's now? He's done a great job. I mean, defensively, disruptive, um, scrappy, 50-50 balls, um, uh, freedom offensively, space the court. Um, you know, a bunch of really good players. He's done a great job. And you think of, you know, where they were and where they are now and where they're headed. Whew. Great job. Back right, Coach. Josh Graham, WSJS. In the spirit of reminiscing and also the fact you're here in North Carolina, I was hoping you could put something to rest. Um, to rest. You've, you've said a couple years ago you were close to taking the NC State job back when you were at Memphis, and recently Josh Pasner told us that you told him it was a bad pizza experience that might have led to you not taking the job. Can you? Josh is out of his mind. No, they, they look. I've had people talk to me throughout my career, and, and, and NC State was one of those teams, and and. Uh, um, you know, knowing what that league was and all that stuff, but I ended up staying, and uh, we had a heck of a run at Memphis, and it was the right decision for me and uh, probably both programs. But, uh, no, pizza, I can't remember. He's – that's the greatest thing about when you start getting older. You just say, I don't remember. Back left. Was he on the plane with us, by the way? Was Josh – on the plane with us? He wasn't. He's just telling stories. I would, he, said, he, he, he was said, on the plane with us? He said it might have been bad pizza. That's what he told you. No. That's what he told me. No. It was Mellow Mushroom Pizza from yep. Raleigh. Really good place. <laughs> Mellow Mushroom. Coach Mitch Fortner from K-Man Radio in Manhattan. Uh, Marquise Noel, their point guard, number one for Kansas State. Very unique player with his size and range. Have you ran into many point guards like him before? No. No. And uh, deep, quick, uh, big-time usage, creates for his teammates. Um, he is really he's, – he's an All-American, and he deserves to be. Back of the room, Coach. Yeah, D. Scott Fritch and K-State Athletics. Coach, I was just curious. I'm kind of doing something on Naquan Tomlin, number 35 at Kansas State. Uh, seems like he's pretty athletic. I'm just curious your thoughts on him. Um, he's a good player. I mean, they, they have guys that are kind of positionless. Like you would say, is he a four, is he a three, is he a five? What is he? He's just a basketball player, and he is a good athlete. He's a good player. Middle of the room. 
Coach, what do you tell your post players to do on defense when you go up against a team like this that doesn't necessarily have a traditional five man and they have a lot of stretch fours? Um, you're going to have to go out and play these guys. Um, but the other side of it is they got to play us too. So it's okay, you know, we, we're coming at you and, and they do a great job of trapping the post and creating opportunities to steal balls and be disruptive. Um, the good news is the season that you play is to prepare you for these moments. Have we played anybody that plays like them? Um, they also play some good zone. They do on the baseline out. They put a big man on the ball. They do some good stuff. They really do. And I got to see all that last night and this morning in all the tapes I watched. Second row right in front of me, Coach. Aaron Beard with the AP. I was going to ask you, so you were talking about playing free and loose with these guys for the last couple of days. There were moments during the season about frustration building and pressure and those types of things that we saw, like with Oscar, for example. Have they handled – what, what, what like when Oscar? he talked about playing the walk-ons, for example. To get there wasn't – there wasn't. He just – the greatest thing about him, sometimes he just says stuff. <laughs> like, I, could you imagine him coming up and saying, Coach, play the walk-ons? Come on. He didn't – I said, why would you say that? I don't know. It just came to my mind. Okay. So, no, okay, the, but... what happened was you have guys when you go through a season that you get hit in the mouth and you got to learn how to deal with it. And this team, one, they needed to me, they needed to know I believed in them. And the second piece of it is they used it as fuel. And then we come back and we win big games. We lost some games I wish we had back. Um, but I bet you there's every coach in the country that says that. I mean, but, but this is what basketball is. I said it before. This tournament is one game, and it's not best of seven or best of five or best of three. It's one game. Anything can happen. This year has proven it. Last year has proven it. The year before has proven it. It's, it's, you know, you hope you get your kids in a great frame of mind. You ready for this? And they're healthy. you got a healthy team. Because if you don't have a healthy team, touch and go. Because anybody can beat anybody. Just, just to follow up on that, I was just going to say, have, are they, would you said, are they better equipped maybe now over time yeah. to handle this? Are Not you over changing time. anything what in your approach? What they've been through, what they've been through, I told them. Who's more prepared for you to take knocks and punches and throws? And, you know, the, the biggest thing happens in these, this tournament, everybody's going to make runs. When they make a run on you, how are you going to deal with it? The water is boiling. What does it do to you? And I'm like saying, let's just be our best. Let's be our best when this thing heats up. Now, yesterday, we missed seven, eight shots in a row. I wasn't sure we were our best. But I'll tell you where we were our best. We made free throws down the stretch at the end of the game. And that's with water boiling. And you stand up at that line and you make those free throws. And then Oscar Steele was a big play. Um, you know, we, we did what we needed to do. We did not play. We did not. We, we played well offensively. We just missed shots that we need to make. Third row. John Huang, NOLA Media. John, I, I think you're familiar with a book called Ego is the Enemy. I, I know in the past that that's been a big challenge, kind of <clears throat> tamping down the egos of the big stars. But it seems like with this team, it's almost been just the opposite, that you've had to constantly build the guys up. How, how challenging and taxing has that been? And, and why is ego so, so dangerous? Well, you want them to have some swagger. No question, but the the balls that we all all of us coaches and and uh, you know everybody and I'll say this again, every job in college basketball is a hard job. They're all hard. I said to a guy, I love the job I have. I understand what it is. I understand you take shots. That's fine. But we juggle balls as coaches, which is you must hold them accountable. You cannot just let them go on their own because you won't have a team. Yet, you got to build them up. So, you have to hold them accountable, and sometimes you got to do it in a firm way. It's hard to say, you're better than that. I know you're better than that. Play harder. Sometimes, you're being aggressive. 
It doesn't mean you're not being positive or you don't believe in them, but you're being aggressive to get change. Yet, you got to continue to build them up and get them to understand, I believe in you. Yet, this isn't good enough. You can do this. Um, I told Antonio today, you made 11 in a row at Arkansas. How are you missing free throws today? What, what is that? And so, you know, we, we've got a team of good players, terrific guys that care about one another. When the water's boiling, we just need guys to step up. At the end of the day, games we've lost this year, a player on the other team stepped up and went nuts. So then who on our team steps up and goes nuts? So it's, that's part of what we've dealt with. And now we got a bunch of guys. I think we've had six guys score 25 points, which means if you've done it once, means you can do it. I don't care who gets 25 in this game. And I don't think it, our team does either. Somebody step up and go get baskets. To our right. Hey, Cal. Tyler Thompson, Kentucky Sports Radio. The guys were telling us about the TikTok game, and they said you played it today at practice. Can you tell us about it? I didn't and how play did it. I, I saw one of the guys that's supposed to be the best at it not concentrating. And so <laughs> I went, who, 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 who. Like, you could do that for an hour, yet I can't get you to concentrate on this court for three minutes? Come on. And that's why they laughed. I mean, I'm just... But I'm, look, at the end of the day, i got to have fun at this too. And I'm having a ball with this group. I want them to have a great experience. Don't listen to anybody try to steal your joy. they got to do this. He's got to do that. That guy got to... we got to... It means nothing. Just go have fun. Let's see where this goes if we have an enjoyment. And if two teams are enjoying the game and playing well, probably whoever has the ball last wins. Back of the room, left. Coach, Mitch Brown, Fox, Lexington. Uh, the players said that this feeling of, of winning at this level is, is addicting, and they want to continue that. So with that being said, everybody has, has bought into their roles. Just how have you seen that progress this season where – when you were healthy or not healthy earlier on this season, you had to put other guys in other roles, and now they're all in their right role. I would say they are, um, but we're still having a mismatch of how we're trying to play. You know, I mean, you know, we, uh, we're shorthanded a little bit, but so are other teams. But they are – I'm telling them, be a star at your role. Be an absolute star at what you do for us. Who was a star at his role last game? Oscar, he got 25 rebounds, most in 53 years when they started the Waltons and Little House on the Prairie. And I mean, it was 53 years ago. He was a star at his role. He only had eight points. He was a star at his role. How about you're a star defensively? How about you're a star at getting 50-50 balls? How about you're a star scoring baskets when we need it? How about you're a star defensively you go block a shot and do that's it's all just be who you are take what they give you if they give us a lot of threes we'll shoot them if they're giving us drives we'll take them if they're collapsing we'll kick out I mean just more right now mm -mm. less is more less is more right now because it is all about let's play our best and that means clear mind play with joy have fun with each other you're looking at me I'm a cheerleader right now Telling the staff, all you got to keep saying, be positive. Keep being positive. Sometimes when you're coaching, it may come across as you're being negative. When you're, come on, man, you're better than that. Go get that ball. They may take it as, oh, he's being negative. No, you, you, that's coaching. But sometimes you got to say, but you're doing good. You just keep playing. Keep shooting. I told uh, Antonio last night, he ran by me. I said, you keep shooting the ball now. You let it go. Told Chris the same thing. Shoot the ball, man. They're wide open. Shoot it. Middle of the room. Yeah, John, you talk about the boiling water and the intensity of this event and all. How gratifying was it for you to see Damien perform the way he did, given everything he's been through this year? He's been, uh, he's been a pleasure, and it's been you know one of the high points of m me coaching this season is seeing him come back from what he had to do. You may not know, folks, his dad passed away suddenly in Lexington, and uh, we had to go 
wasn't answering the phone. We went over, and eventually the, Damien went over to C2 and was there, and it just – it was awful. Um, you know, Dad was young. He's got – he's the oldest. He's got young, a young brother, a young sister, um, mom, Kim. I mean, it just was a rough time for him. Lost 17 pounds. Now you see him smiling, and I'm grabbing him and appreciate you, Coach. You know, I mean, it's – you know, those are the things that are most satisfying. Yeah, I want to win every game I coach. If you know me, you know that's how I am. I want to win every game I coach. But that is like a big-time win, what's happened for him. I come back to Jacob, where Jacob was, and now where he is now. That's a W. Oscar – four weeks of a knee surgery and being out for a while, and then him now coming into his own. Our freshmen doubting themselves. Now all of a sudden, they're, they're helping us. Antonio, same deal. Where he was and where he is now just makes you happy because that's what we're about as coaches. We just want to see growth and see kids smile and be happy and the growth and – and uh, they're that way. You're in the best position to win ball games. Back of the room, on the aisle. Hey, John. Noah Hiles, Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Obviously, Western Pennsylvania heavily represented here in Greensboro this weekend. <laughs> Curious to hear uh, a story or just a memory of a young young Sean Miller when you were uh, recruiting him to Pitt. Well, first of all, his dad was in my practice today. Uh, Darrell Porter and Jason Matthews were in my hotel room today. Um, that was the backcourt, Brian uh, Shorter and Bobby Martin. And so, um, Sean, when I went, to, I went to see him at Rochester High School, um, and his dad was really demanding. Great coach. Better coach than Sean, me, Arch, all of us, okay? His dad was watching. I was watching the game. Sean went 12 out of 13 from the floor. Rochester was in the summer league. And I went up to Coach Miller, and I said, man, he said, can you believe he missed that? Didn't hold his follow-through. If he held his follow-through, he made that shot. I mean, he was challenged his whole playing career. I, I want you to know now, he was rookie of the year, freshman of the year in the Big East back then. I know the Big East is good now, but back then it was crazy. Wasn't as many teams. I mean, it was nuts. And he was freshman of the year. Um, just a competitor. Loved being around him. They're, they're family. I mean... His grandmother raised my mother. I mean, I was in his grandmother's house more than I was in my own house. So, but he's, you know, and then seeing Pitt doing what they're doing. I mean, how they've done. Jeff's done it. He's done, you know. I mean, come on. It's, these are all hard jobs. And when you struggle some and you got to bounce it and keep going, I always say that's when the real coaching happens. That's when you get knocked in the head. And everybody's on you. And it's all, how, do you, how do you keep focused on your kids and getting your team better and just stay away from all the clutter and not let anybody steal your joy? Well, he's done that at Pitt. And um, they were leading the ACC for a while. I mean, I'm like, they're going to win the ACC. And then Sean, the job he's done, you know, to step in and uh, – you know, do the things he's done. And, and I even said to him, I saw him out there, I go, man, when you were down 13, I said, my, they won the game. And I said, well, how'd they do? They won pretty easy. And he said, my guys say, no, they were down 13. I went, you're kidding me. And they came back. It shows a lot. I mean, in this tournament, you get down 13, and the other team is playing loose and free because they got nothing to lose. And now every shot, every free throw becomes – Again, that was a great job for him to get his team win it and survive and march on. That's all we're all trying to do. Last question, front row. Coach, last night we were talking to Jacob, and he said he hoped no one ever got as low mentally as he did during this season. Have you ever had a player go from that low all the way up to, you name him, team captain before, the, before this tournament? And then what does it meant to this team and to you to see that turnaround? Well, you know, I had to do some soul search in there, too, because was I the reason he was where he was? Like, am I being too hard? Am I not realizing what this kid is going through? The expectations, my hopes and dreams, and they're vanishing before my eyes. And, 
you know, but he wasn't the only guy on my team that way. And we had some other guys go through the same, maybe not as hard as he went through it. But again, now you think if you're me and you're looking at these kids like you're, they're your own children and you see what he's done. Now you don't think I'm ecstatic for this kid and his family. I told his mom, I'm so proud of your son because he was in a tough place. And she said, I know, and I know. And, but what I've told all these guys, because there was an onslaught, there was the attacking mode, making it personal on these kids. And I said, look, what we all went through, you all in your life are going to be able to look back on this season. And you're going to say, if I could have gotten through that, I can get through anything. There's nothing I can't do with it. And you may say, it's only a game. Put yourself in their shoes. Be 18, 19 years old and reading stuff on social media that is so nasty, it's ridiculous. And you're 19 and 20. You could have, we didn't deal with that stuff. None of you in here dealt with that stuff. But they have. And I told them, I said, look, nothing that you will go through. You'll be able to be challenged in any way, especially in this sport, and say, I can do this. Yeah, I may be down, and I may be under attack, but you know what? I've dealt with this before, and I came out on the other side pretty darn good. So I'm happy for him and all these kids. I mean, think about CJ. This poor kid can't catch a break. Every time I turn around, it's an ankle. It's a rib. It's a, I'm like, what in his hamstring? What is going on? And you know what? He's never changed his attitude. He's always upbeat. He's always helpful. How about I told him at Arkansas, when I knew Kaysen wasn't playing, I need you five minutes a half. Can you do it? He said, yeah, I'll give you five minutes. He gave me like 12 or 13. And in the end, he said, I can't breathe anymore. He's a broken rib. But without him, we don't win that game. That's what I'm talking. They've all been through stuff. Every player on this team has been through stuff. So I just want them to have a great experience. They deserve it. Don't know what that means. We know who we're playing. We know how good they are. Um, I just want us to be at our best, and then we'll see what happens. Thanks, Thank Coach. you. Okay, home stretch, start uh, Kansas State, student athletes 355.
Kansas State will be bringing Marquis Snow, Naquan Tomlin, and Keontae Johnson. And we'll schedule to start at 3.55, so about five minutes. Always a chance that they arrive early. Okay, here we go with uh, Kansas State. Thank you, guys. Okay, we'll have 20 minutes with the student athletes from Kansas State. We have Marquis No, Naquan Tomlin, and Keontae Johnson. Remind everybody, please turn the volume down on your uh, cell phones. Raise your hand. Let us get the handheld mics to you. Let us know who you are and who you're affiliated with. We'll start front row. First question. Yeah, D. Scott Fritch and uh, K-State Athletics. Uh, Naquan, you mentioned before that this was kind of a dream come true. And I'm wondering if you could expound upon that. Tell me exactly why this is a dream come true for you. Um, how you doing? Uh, I just, it's a dream come true because uh, growing up where I come from uh, in Harlem, like, not every kid gets an opportunity like this. And so I just wanna, you know, uh, thank God and thank my family, you know, to like keep me like pushing and doing what I have to do. And uh, my teammates around me, you know, they help support me as well, so. Middle of the room. Hey guys, Kellis Robinette here from the Kansas City Star. I got a question for both Keontae and Naquan. When you're going up against a guy who had 25 rebounds the night before you play him, what's just your mindset to kind of keep him off the class? Keontae. It's a team effort. It's, a, um, it's gonna be a team effort. Um, we know 
he gives them a lot of second chance points. So we just got to limit the offensive rebound, um, box them out, find him when they get shots up. I mean, he's going to get his no matter what. I mean, that's what he do this whole year. He was national player of the year last year. So um, we just got to have a team effort. Um, we all going to come together and we're going to have a solution for it. Naquan? Uh, he pretty much uh, said it. But yeah, definitely a team effort. Uh, you know, we have to make sure we rebound uh, all five guys in the paint. Uh, so we can limit them from getting second chance points or just offensive rebounds. So, yeah, definitely team effort. To our right. Yeah, John Clay, Lexington Hero Leader. Can I tell you, you mentioned last night that you and Oscar have a relationship. Can you just talk a little more about that? Um, I mean, I know him since high school. Um, he he was one of the main person that reached out to me uh, when I was going to my – when I collapsed in the game. Uh, and we've just been close since then. Um, I text him. He texts here and there, like every, probably once every two months or something. But I mean, real cool, like one of my brothers. So, left aisle. Aaron Gershon with the Cats Paws in Lexington. Keontae, obviously, Coach Cal last year talked about how he got emotional just seeing you, and I think he offered you to score on your senior night. Just what did that mean to you? And just going up against his teams in the past, what, what, what do you remember of those matchups? Um, I mean, it means a lot from Coach Cal. He's one of uh, one of the Great coach. Um, we have a great relationship. Just playing against him and just show the respect that he had for my game. Um, last year he wanted me to score, but I didn't know at the time, so I just kissed the floor. But now I really appreciate Coach Kyle and just everything he done. Middle of the room. Yeah, uh, Alec Bussey, Rivals. Naquan, when you watch film of Oscar and his rebounding abilities, what is most impressive about his ability to kind of control his body within the air and kind of create space by using his body? Uh, uh, he's, uh, I mean, he's a really good player. Uh, he's real physical, and I feel like, uh, you know, his strength helps him, especially he has a high motor. So, uh, you know, you just have to limit him, you know, again, uh, deep paint touches. So we can limit him from being, you know, close to the rim and just have to box him out. A reminder to everybody that recording press conference on your cell phones and cameras is prohibited. Front row. Yeah, for um, D. Scott Fritch and K-State Athletics, for Marquise and Keontae, I was just curious if you might be able to fill me in on just the experience of having Naquan on the team this year and maybe his upside going forward. Marquise. Um, Naquan is a tremendous player uh, and an even better person. Um, to have him on the team this year is a blessing um, because he just started playing basketball what, four years ago. So his upside is, is really high. Um, he still has a lot of things that he could work on and get better. And he's already, already so talented, so just Having him this year is a huge piece of, of our success in our team. And I can't wait to see, you know, down the line how much better he gets. Keontae? Yeah, Naquan, he's a big piece for us. Um, he spaced the floor out for us, mismatch for other teams. And, I mean, that just helps get everybody else involved in the offense and scoring. And, I mean, like he said, he only played four years. It's his first um, year on the big stage, and he's doing a hell of a job at it. So, just – He's got a great upside, and just I can't wait to see what he got in store for sure. Back right. I'm Mark Story from the Lexington Herald Leader. Marquise uh, Kason Wallace, the Kentucky point guard, is big. You know, he's a big guy. What's the challenge of playing against a bigger guard, and just what are your impressions of him? Um, I've been playing against big guards my whole life. I mean, I'm five seven um, on a good day. Um, so that, that, that wouldn't be a challenge um, to play against, you know, bigger and tougher opponents. Uh, my heart will uh, determine how the game will go, and I'm going to leave it all on the line, you know, tomorrow. Um, but this is a total team effort. This is Kentucky versus K-State. This is not about me and Kaysen. Um So I just, I'm going to do everything in my power to get the win and help my team win. Back left. Yeah, uh, back here. No, Nicole Auerbach, The Athletic. Marquise, um, what does it mean to be a basketball player from New York City? I mean, it's, it's, it's a blessing. I mean, I get my toughness, my grittiness from just playing in parks in New York City. Um, like Naquan said, coming, coming from where we come from, 
a lot of kids don't get this opportunity um, to play on this stage, to play in college basketball and at this level. So, you know, I'm just embracing it. Um, I'm trying to be an inspiration to kids back home um, to show them that, you know, you could do whatever you, you want to do if you work hard, believe in God, and, you know, trust yourself. Middle of the room. Marquise, I got two for you. Uh, first off, what time did you uh, actually fall asleep this morning, I guess it was? <laughs> and secondly, do you think having some athletic bigs like Naquan and David can actually work to your advantage in this game when you're playing against a team that has a traditional five? Um, to answer the first question, I went to sleep around like 4 a.m. Um, and woke up at 10.30, but that's the grind. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for it. That means we survived in advance. Um, and secondly, uh, I mean, guys like Naquan and David and Bebe um, are really good bigs um, because they give us three different looks. Naquan, you know, spaces the floor out, and he much a, he's like a guard. Um, and David and Bebe give us that, you know, inside presence that we need, that rim protection that we need. Um, and I feel like uh, tomorrow will be a great uh, challenge for us and the bigs to step up to, you know, help us help help out the team win with with containing Oscar Shibe and you know just we have really good bigs and tomorrow would be a great challenge for them. Right in front of me, third row. Yes, uh, Jeff Drummond with uh, Rivals Kentucky. Um, question for any of you guys: uh, You've played in a great league, had all kinds of uh, high-end competition this year. Does Kentucky? remind you of any of the teams you've faced so far, you know, either in watching them on TV or in film study? We'll start from our far right, Conte. Um, I mean, they have, like, some of the players that resembles from other teams. I mean, I feel like everybody play physical, um, fast. Um, they play, they get out on fast break like TCU, so we know we got to limit them off that, and they rebound like West Virginia. So we just, I mean, we kind of used to it. We just we know what it takes to win, and we know what we have to do as a team to get it up. So, Naquan, <clears throat> uh, like Keontae said, they do have some similar players to like, but that we've gone against uh, in our conference. But I don't think we've had to play against a uh, center like Oscar, uh, like a dominant big like that. So uh, that would be something new to us. But I think with the plan that we have, I feel like we'll execute. Tie best ability. Marquise? Um, yeah, like both the guys said, uh, we we play in one of the toughest conferences in, in the country. We play in the Big 12. Um, every night is a tough night. Um, so that, I mean, it won't change in that aspect. But like Naquan said, we haven't faced a big like Oscar yet. Um, so it will be a total team effort um, on stopping him and limiting him to, uh, to one shot and one opportunity. Second row to our right. Mitch Fortner came in Radio Manhattan for Marquise and Aquan. I know it's one game at a time, but a win tomorrow means Madison Square Garden. Being from New York City, is there extra motivation to now get to the garden? Aquan. Uh, it's definitely some motivation. Uh, one is motivation to continue playing and motivation just to play in the garden. So uh, yeah, that's that. And, uh, yeah, but like you said, we want to take everything one at a time and focus on what we have to do right now. Marquise? Uh, it's definitely some motivation uh, to go back home. Um, I ain't go home in three years. I stood uh, at my school and just worked out. So it would be, you know, a blessing just to go back to, to Madison Square Garden, uh, my hometown. But we got to take it one day at a time. Uh, we got to focus on our scout today, focus on our game plan on how to stop, you know, Kentucky. But, um, yeah, it's some motivation. In front of me, middle of the room, back. Arnie Green from the Topeka Capital Journal. Um, Coach Calipari talked about the, the challenge you guys present as a matchup because you're, you have a lot of kind of positionless players. But he said, on the flip side, you guys have to adjust just to their style, too. Do you, do you see this as kind of a a game of contrasting styles, and uh, who do you like as far as the style? Keontae? Um, I mean, I feel like if we just focus probably on ourselves, we'll be fine. Um, I mean, we we got to watch. We still watching films, still learning them. 
But I feel like every, I mean, we haven't faced, like he said, we're in the toughest conference, so we face different styles of play and how different teams play. Or we played the SEC team before, so I mean, I don't think it would be anything uh, hard that we can't contain, really. Naquan? Uh, yeah, like what Keontae said, I don't think it would be something that uh, would be a, much of a challenge besides uh, Oscar. But, you know. That's it. I mean, yeah, really. That's it, man. Um, we play in the toughest league, in the, like I said, in the country. We play in the Big 12 from top to bottom. You know, it's a tough night. Um, but I like my chances with, with my guys. Um, because we are gritty, we are tough, we are hard nosed. Uh, we have a great coaching staff from top to bottom, and I know that you know they'll do a good job of game planning um, versus Kentucky. Middle of the room. Yeah, Daryl Bird with Cats Paws in Lexington. For Marquise, I think everybody assumes five seven is a disadvantage. I'm curious, what do you think are the advantages to being a smaller point guard that you can do against some of the bigger defenders? Uh, when I fall, I'm closer to the floor than everybody else. So <laughs> that's what I mean. It's, um, nah, but I mean, just my toughness and my heart, you know, just uh, overpowers, you know, any height or any, you know, structure to anybody. Um, I just play with that passion. So. Third row. John Huang, NOLA Media. This is for anyone who wants to answer, but normally the, the first game of the tournament is, is the most difficult. You get through that, you get that under your belt. Uh, how, do you, how far can you guys take this thing? Yeah. Do you have any specific goals in mind now that you've gotten the first one? Keontae? Uh, I mean, our goal from the beginning of the season was national championship. So, I mean, we always just pre just take one game at a time, never try to look ahead and focus on other schools and other outcomes, just worry about what we can control. And yesterday we went one to know, so now we're trying to focus on Kentucky and go one to know there so we can get to Madison Square Garden for the Sweet 16. Naquan? Uh, most definitely. Uh, I feel like. Um, I think we got the question. I think we got the question. He's basically. Uh, I forgot that shit too. I got the Can you repeat the question? <laughs> we forgot. <laughs> a lot of times, the first game of the tournament is is yeah, the yeah. toughest. You know, is there a sense of relief that you've gotten that under your belt, and now that you've gotten that, how far can you take this thing? Uh, we're just gonna go one at a time. You know, getting the win yesterday, uh, it was good for us, and so uh, I feel like it gave us the momentum going into this next game, and I feel like we're gonna execute. Uh, the, the plan to our best ability? Uh, I, I keep hearing that, that, you know, the first game is always the toughest game. Um, but I never understood it because I never uh, played in March. But um, we're going to approach it like how we approach every game, um, which is going 1-0, and winning a day, uh, doing rehab, and just doing everything that, that we've been doing throughout the course of the year. Uh, because it's, it's been giving us success. So uh, we're not looking too far ahead. We're not looking in the past. We're looking at the present and focusing on that. Marquise, we've talked to you a lot this year. Um, I can't remember too many times where you've made jokes in press settings. You've done it twice now today. Is there a reason why you're lighter making jokes at this time of the year in the NCAA tournament? I mean, life is fun. I mean, I'm here. It's a blessing to be here. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just happy and grateful that I get to be, you know, here playing in March Madness. So just having fun. And that's a part of my personality too. So Yeah, if if this is off base, just ignore it. I'm wondering, did you follow Tyler Euless, who was UK's five eight point guard about five years ago? About dang, you did your research. Yeah, it was about five years <laughs> ago. Uh but Tyler Euless, uh before I even knew he was playing Kentucky, you know, I I studied him, I watched him, you know, uh, in his college days on what gained him success. Um, so just his defense and just his playmaking ability, you know, I watched and studied over the course of the years. And I try to implement that into my game. And it's just so crazy to see that, you know, he's now on the sideline, a GA at Kentucky. Um, and it feels like a full circle moment because just a few years ago, I was asking him tips on what I could do to become a better player. 
and he helped me. So he's he's much like a big brother to me. Third row. The Kentucky players said that they weren't watching any of these other March Madness games. Have you guys been tuned in, and any of those games stand out to you? Uh, John? Oh, my fault. Yeah, I mean, we've been watching it. We just um, try to use some of the game as motivation. Um, we've seen Purdue um, teams, UVA, just coming in and not taking, like, every possession, or they losing off, like, a one possession. So we just try to learn from it and just – we didn't want to be that example as well, so we just trying to go out there and have fun, really. Naquan? Right, yeah, we definitely use those games as motivation. We've seen like, uh, like lower seed teams come in and play like very hard and you know upset some teams. So we, like Keontae said, we didn't want that happening to us. So we tried to you know remove like the seedings from like our names or whatnot and just play as hard as we could. Marquise. Um, it's March. I mean, it's the best time of college basketball, so it's hard not to watch, you know, games um, nowadays. But uh, I just watch basketball. I'm in love with basketball, so whenever I get a chance to, you know, wind down and turn on the TV, you know, I watch some games here and there. Any other questions? Front row. Uh, D. Scott Fritch and uh, KSAT Athletics. Nate Kwan, I'm just curious if you mentioned playing ball for four years now, and we had talked in the summer about your experience and heading forward. Can you describe to me just what the season has been like for you and also where you can go from here? Uh, only the Lord knows where I can go from here. Uh, and, you know, over the season, like in the off season, I'll definitely like be working hard and stuff like that. But the experience was uh, you know, new to me, like coming into this league, I've always heard that it was going to be like the best conference in college basketball, and I know it was going to be super physical, and so like that was something that I wanted to do so I can prove myself to you know, uh, to, like families and stuff like that, and like the coaching staff they believed in me, and so definitely want to get better for like uh, for me the following year. Anyone else? All right, thanks guys. Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Reminder, the Kansas State locker room is still open. Also, Hammond Communications will post a recording of this press conference and all others in the NCAA Digital Media Hub. You can find that at www.ncaa.veritone.com. Appreciate all your help waiting for the handheld mic and letting us know who you are. So you guys have been great to work with. Okay, we're about ready to start with Coach Tang. Hey, hey, how good to see you. All right, you have 20 minutes of questions. 20? Yeah. I think I'll use them all. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> oh. here we go. Who has the first question? Ah, oh, they done. <laughs> Coach Tang, D. Scott Fritch, and KSA Athletics. Um, Interested in uh, what you've thought of Naquan's play this season and just his upside? Um, you know, I think uh, the adjustment to Division One basketball, uh, it actually went pretty quick for Quan, but then the adjustment to scouting reports um, then kind of took a toll on him, and he's learning how to work consistently, you know, and uh, that, that's going to help his game. 
uh, you know, to be more consistent because we've seen him be really good and then really bad. Um, uh, he's got as much talent as anybody I've, I've ever coached. And so his upside is through the roof. Uh, we just need him to um, just continue to, you know, develop the same old boring habits and, and build a consistent work ethic. Coach, how valuable was, was David last night and how valuable can he be going forward? I, you know, David was huge. He did a great job defensively. Uh, he might, might, might be our best defensive player, you know, with his ability to, to switch and guard multiple positions. And then, you know, his speed at his size, you know, separates him from the other guys his size. So uh, if we can get, you know, close to double figures and rebound in the way he did, uh, it's going to be very valuable to us. Aaron Beard with the AP. Last night, Ed Coley said that Oscar Shibwe has that it factor, like Dennis Rodman kind of thing on the rebounding. What, when you look at him on film, kind of what, what stands out to you about the challenge that a guy like that represents and how you as a team sort of try to keep a guy like that contained, I guess, for lack of a better word? Well, uh, I didn't have to look at Oscar on film. I re recruited him really hard um, when he was coming out of high school and then uh, watched him play for two years and competed against him at West Virginia. You know, so we've seen it up close and personal. And he does have that it. And Oscar's in their wins and losses, Oscar gets double-doubles, and he does that. And so, um, you know, we will try to make it difficult for him, but, you know, guys like that do what they do. Third row. Yes, uh, Jeff Drummond from uh, Rivals, Kentucky. I asked uh, some of your players uh, who Kentucky kind of closely resembles, if anyone, in, in your league in that great competition that you faced. Do uh, you have any thoughts uh, along those lines? Um, you know, I, I don't know about as a team. We, we have, like, individual comps, like each guy plays similar to another. And uh, we was unable to find a comp for Oscar Chibwe in our league. Middle of the room. Hey, Jerome, Kel Chubbnett here with the Kansas City Star. Uh, two questions for you. First off, a quick one. Were you able to sleep last night? No. So you're, you're on zero sleep right now. I don't know about zero, but, like, it, it went pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, same for me. Um, and I didn't stay up scouting Kentucky, so. Uh, but secondly, I know you're a guy who likes to make the other team to rea react to what you do. I'm wondering, with athletic big guys like David and Naquan, do you think you can make Kentucky react to those guys with the post players that they have? Ooh. Um, now, you know, we're going we're gonna to have to just be who we are. You know, this, we can't change anything. And I, I don't know. I think Cal's a guy who just, they do what they do. And, um, you know, uh, I'm, I want to make this, uh, the game plan as simple as possible for our guys so we can play with freedom. And I'm sure he wants to do the same with his. Alec Bussey, Rivals. Coach Tank, how do you challenge your guys to be physical and willing to kind of hit bodies on the inside against a physical player like Oscar Shibuya? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I. Like, you can't, um, you can't wrestle with Oscar, right? You're going to lose that. We don't have anybody on our team who can, like, go into a physical wrestling match with him. So we're going to have to use our speed and our quickness to make it uh, difficult for him. And then we're going to have to gang, gang rebound. But, I mean, everybody asks these questions about Oscar, right? But it, it's those dudes out there that are making threes, right, that th those are the ones that, like, determine winning or losing. And so we, we, got, we, got, we got a whole team out there to guard. It's not just Oscar Chibwe. Any other questions? Third row. Hey, Coach. John Huang, NOLA Media. One of the other guys that you have to deal with is, is the point guard, Kentucky's point guard, Kaysen Wallace, big, strong guy. And, you know, on the surface, you're looking at you got a little guy, they got a big guy. How, how do you anticipate heading into that matchup? 
Man, sounds like they got a big guy at every position, and we got a little guy at every position. So, you know, <laughs> we're going to have to figure something out. But uh, Kason's another kid that I recruited really hard out of high school and know him very well. You know, I, I've just always thought he was the, the ultimate winner uh, in the state of Texas in high school basketball, and um, it, it's going to be a challenge. Front row. Yeah, D. Scott Fritch and uh, Case at Athletics. Coach uh, Naquan mentioned that this was a dream come true for him um, earlier uh, yesterday. I'm just curious, what kind of dream this has been for you? Um, well, this whole year has been, you know, a dream come true for me. From you know the moment I got the job uh, to putting the team together, and you know, just you know through the whole course of the season, the way our guys have um, embraced us as a staff and embraced each other and, you know, and culminating in playing in the ultimate tournament. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a dream and one that we don't want to see end. So uh, I'm super excited about the opportunity we have for tomorrow. And, um, you know, so we just, just want to keep living this thing, try, trying to be together a little bit longer. Third row. Coach Calipari has emphasized over and over again how difficult it is to be a coach among the college ranks. Uh, would, would you agree with that? And, you know, coming from um, uh, being an assistant coach for so long under a successful program, uh, there is a fraternity of, of college coaches out there. And do you, do you feel that sense of camaraderie out, out there among the coaching staff? Um. I know with the guys that I've lived life with the last few years, last 20 years, uh, we have more than a camaraderie. It's a, it's a family. A, 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 I mean, one of those guys, my daughter's godfather, and the other one I call about any advice that has nothing to do with the game of basketball. Uh, you know, so yeah, we do build this bond together, and um, you know, it's it's difficult to do what we do. Uh, but I wouldn't want to be doing anything else, you know, and uh, anything in life that's worth accomplishing or, or great is going to have difficulties in it. And, you know, I, I'm thankful to be in a position where the things that are important to me, you know, character, integrity, love, you know, faith, that I get to pour into my young men every day. I wouldn't want anybody else doing it. To our right, second row. Mitch Fortner from came in Radio Manhattan. Um, yesterday's second session was very blue uh, when it came to the crowd. And of course, it's been really tough to play on the road in the Big 12. Uh, how much of the message is being able to play in front of what will, might be a road environment tomorrow? Well, I'm colorblind, so I didn't see that. You know, it all looked purple to me. And uh, so, I mean, you know, we, we, we've played in tough environments and we've won in tough environments. We've lost in tough environments. Tomorrow's not going to be about the environment. It's going to be about the 10 dudes that are on the floor. To our left. Tim Everson, Manhattan Mercury. How, how much has Cam progressed this season? And, and what, what has he grown the most in? Uh, well, early on, uh, Cam was going 100 miles an hour. And he's learned how to slow down and, you know, cha play at different paces. And then also, like, figuring out what he can do to help us win, that he, his value. And, and sometimes that means actually doing less or trying to do less. And so uh, he's just really embraced uh, what we need them to do to give us a chance to win. Coach, you mentioned now a lot of the questions have been about Oscar in regards to Kentucky. That they have other guys that are threats. Jacob Toppin is one of those guys who's really playing well at this time of year. Just curious about your thoughts on, on what you've seen from him. From him. Uh, I mean, J Jacob and Reeves, uh, I mean, those two guys, long, athletic, guard, wings, wherever you need them, you know, uh, bo both of the good defenders. You know, they cause you problems with their length, rebound, you know, topping when and whenever Kaysan gets, you know, his 10 seconds break, 
than, uh, you know, Toppin plays the point for him. You know what I mean? He's just so valuable and so versatile and experienced, right? Like that, like experience trumps talent all the time right now. And so uh, you just, just can't. You can't put a number on the value of that. Middle of the room. What would you say is the hardest thing about getting ready for a second game of the tournament on 36 hours prep time? Is it rest? Is it actually game planning from you guys? What's the hardest thing about it? Um, coming down off the high of the win, um, then, you know, getting the rest that's needed, you know, for your body to recover and figuring out the balance of how much is too much and not enough. Second row. I have a little bit of a big picture question for you. Uh, you hired Kevin Sutton on your staff to, as uh, d director of strategies. I'm curious, kind of what was your thinking in adding a position like that at a time when we see more college coaches adding more positions, recruiting specific or analytics? It seems like there's more coaching infrastructure going into doing the job. Yeah, um, Kevin in particular, I've known for over 25 years. We worked five-star camp together um, back when I first started coaching. And he's someone that I really leaned on and would call and ask questions because he had started, you know, Mount Verde Academy and uh, before that Montrose Christian. And uh, just I think he's one of the best player development guys in the world. Uh, worked with USA Basketball. And so just super blessed to be able to even – have the opportunity to hire him. Um, I, I've got uh, three, I guess there are four of them now, uh, former GAs and managers that work in the front office at the Phoenix Suns. And uh, those guys told me that, you know, the four guys that are on the bench across the country are probably the same. It's the next level that separates you. And so my chief of staff, Marco Bourne, uh, Kevin Sutton, director of strategy, Austin Carpenter, you know, player development, uh, Anthony Winchester in the video coordinator's role. They do a great job of building our GA program and our managers and because those guys spend way more time with our players than we actually are allowed to. And so um, that's where I feel like it's going to bring separation in our program uh, because it will enhance our development of our players because we're not always going to get the guys that are already there. Not that I don't think that we're going to land some five-star guys that people think are one and done and all of that. But, um, you know, we're going to find that talent that's there and be able to develop them. And then people are going to ask, man, where did they come from? Second row. Can I just ask a follow-up to that? Is, is this just kind of the nature of the way things are going in college basketball? We've seen in college football analysts and quality control types kind of fill in these positions. Is this just what it's going to take in the new landscape of the portal and everything else to takes more hands to do the job? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a long time ago, somebody said many hands make light work, and it greatly applies to what we do. And it's, we have to spend more time recruiting our own guys than we do the guys that are not here. And the goal is to be able to show them the big picture that we have for them. Otherwise, when I was at Baylor, uh, I think the, the national average was 43% transfer rate. And our, our average was 16%. And I hope to develop that same type of program here where guys don't want to leave, but they, they, they want to come. Anyone else? OK. Hey. Thank you, Coach. Thank you all. See you in quite 20 minutes. All right. Appreciate it. See you tomorrow. Yes, sir. Thank you all.